right. Wow. That was good crowd response. Um, hi, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to the Next Cycle Pitch Showcase. My name is Ashima Sukhdev, and I work with Seattle Public Utilities. Oh, that's not working. Um, let me try this. Sorry, we'll get this sorted. But, um, I work with Seattle Public Utilities. I'm our climate mitigation and circular economy policy advisor. I am a small part of the very large Next Cycle Washington family that you're going to be meeting with and interacting with today. And I'm here today to firstly introduce you to the Next Cycle program, and then to just help ground us in our common understanding of what the circular economy is and why it matters. Before we get started, I just wanted to get a sense of who's in the room, and sorry to the folks online. Um, if you work in government like me, could you raise your hands, give me a wave? Very nice. Oh, wow, a lot of folks. Um, okay, how about private sector? You work in a business. Very nice. Also a lot of folks. Um, what about people that work in a nonprofit or a community-based organization? Amazing. Where here at UW, do we have any educators or folks that work in academia? Oh, nice. Just a couple. Welcome. Thanks for having us here. Um, fantastic. And I'm sure there are some investors in the room as well as online. I won't make you identify yourselves just yet. So what is Next Cycle? It is essentially a program that is supporting circular businesses and projects in Washington. It provides mentoring, networking, and access to various funding pathways for circular businesses and projects that are based here in Washington to help them really grow and thrive. I wanna introduce you to the various um, supporters of this program and the people that have made this possible. Next Cycle is an inherently collaborative initiative, as you can see by the broad variety of um, public sector folks that are supporting the initiative. It all started back in 2021 with King County, um, who really got the ball rolling on this. And they were soon joined by a number of partners, including Washington State Department of Commerce, the Department of Ecology, the Washington Recycling Development Center, and Seattle Public Utilities as well. The team behind Next Cycle Washington is also very collaborative. These are the doers, the people that are on the ground implementing the work. We have Cascadia Consulting, Traversal, RRS, and Stark Consulting. All of these companies are mission-driven firms that are really driving and supporting the idea of an inclusive circular economy. I also wanted to take the time to acknowledge the significant contributions from a number of public, private, and community stakeholders who have really been involved in the program since its very um, beginning through the co-design process. These folks have helped at every point of the program to ensure that it's as equitable as possible. And so thank you for, for being involved um, since its initiation. All right, rewinding a little bit. When I was introducing the Next Cycle program, I just threw in circular businesses and projects like we all know what on earth that means. Um, I wanted to get us all on the same page of what the circular economy is and why it matters. For many of us, this is what we do day in and day out, but for a lot of folks in the room and online, it's actually a fairly new concept, or you simply don't realize that you are part of this thing called the circular economy. In essence, it's a fairly simple idea. We're trying to move from a linear take, make, dispose economy to one where we're eliminating the idea of waste. It really is a fundamental rethink of our relationship with resources and stuff. In a circular economy, we are making and buying less, potentially. We are doing better with less. We are making and um, buying products that last longer. We're designing for repair, reuse, for recycling, for remanufacturing. And in community, we're doing things like fixing and sharing and donating and reselling. I find that the easiest way really to kind of understand the circular economy and to get to grips with the sheer breadth of what this idea encompasses is through some real life examples. 
you're going to hear from 14 amazing um, businesses and organizations that are working in the circular economy space today. You're also going to hear from our keynote speaker, who will be sharing her story. And all of their stories will be bringing to life this idea of the circular economy. I wanted to share a few um, of my personal favorite stories as well to get us started and to really sh showcase what's happening outside of Washington and in the rest of the world. We're gonna start off in London, which is home for me, um, and a company called Winnow Solutions. They were founded about 10 years ago with the idea of eliminating food waste in commercial kitchens. What I mean by that is um, think hotels, resorts, casinos, larger restaurants. They have developed an incredible technology, which you can see in the photos, where they have um, essentially an intelligent camera that sits on top of a compost or food waste bin in a commercial kitchen. And um, the technology using artificial intelligence can identify what food waste is being thrown away and how much of it is being thrown away. It then provides amazing analytics, quantitative data, um, insights to the chefs that are working in those kitchens so that they can make better decisions about food waste in their menus. An example is um, at a hotel breakfast buffet, they may notice that on weekends, a lot of hard boiled eggs are being thrown away at the end of the day. Um, too healthy for some perhaps. And so the chef can make some pretty independent decisions. All right, I'm not gonna put out as many this weekend and let's see what happens, or I'm gonna change the menu a little bit and try and prevent this food waste. They have just in the last 10 years um, been working with thousands of uh, chefs in 67 different countries. They are saving each year 36 million meals from being thrown away and $42 million for their clients. That's just one example of startups that are working in the circular economy space. We're now heading over to Brazil. The city of Belo Horizonte, which is, um, has a population of about 3 million people. They were facing a fairly significant problem with e-waste, like a lot of cities are. And so they decided to establish this computer reconditioning center, which essentially is kind of a electronics remanufacturing facility. They get computers that are at the end of their lives, they're a little bit uh, worn, have, have faced some wear and tear maybe, um, laptops and so on. They get them donated to the center and they hire um, local residents, usually from low income communities from the age of 16 to 24, and they train them up on how to fix those computers and refurbish them, um, providing them with technical skill, a technical skill set along the way. The computers that are reconditioned are then distributed to local libraries and public schools to increase um, accessibility to digital technology. In the first nine years of the program, they diverted 7,000 IT products from landfill and 10,000 people went through that training program and received that technical skill set of how to fix a computer. This next example is maybe a familiar household for some of us, a uh, household name for some of us. You've definitely heard a lot of big businesses and corporates out there who are making some fairly bold statements about climate and sustainability issues. IKEA is no different. They have declared that they want to be a circular and climate positive business by 2030, which is fairly ambitious. What that means for a company like IKEA is that they need to rethink the way that they're designing their products, but they also need to rethink their business model. IKEA became famous because of their flat pack design. Any piece of furniture can now be fit into a slim cardboard box and taken home in your car. They're now rethinking how they're designing their furniture to make them make the furniture more easily repairable so you can order spare parts online. Um, they're making them more easy to disassemble so you can take it apart and take it to your new home when you move. And they're also making them with renewable and recycled materials. They're also thinking about how they're interacting with their customers. So in the US and a lot of other countries around the world, they've set up a secondhand um, buyback and resell business. So I, once my IKEA, IKEA furniture is um, 
sort of getting a little old or I'm tired of it, I can sell it uh, back to IKEA, who will then sell it on in a secondhand market. These are just some examples in an amazing wave of activity we're seeing in the circular economy. I'm only only mildly joking when these are all when I say that these are all the tabs that are open on my desktop right now. There's headlines upon headlines of the circular economy in the news right now. It's incredible to see just how mainstream this idea is becoming, and the fact it really shows to me that the idea is taking root. So why should we care? What, why is the circular economy gaining traction? Why is it relevant to us? I think there's, it, in essence, it's a compelling idea for a lot of people. First and foremost, there's significant potential economically. Just ask the investors of Winnow, and I can definitely assure you that IKEA is not just doing this out of the goodness of their heart. There is a business case behind this. We know there are environmental benefits. Yes, the circular economy can prevent waste and pollution, but this is also a critical tool in our fight against climate change. And finally, if this is done correctly, there can be some real, real community and social benefits. We need to make sure that circular jobs and services are creating opportunities for overburdened and underserved communities. And that really brings us back to the next cycle vision. These are the guiding principles of the next cycle program. All of the organizations you're gonna hear from today are working in zero waste, climate action and social equity and hitting that sweet spot and doing it through the, the, the vehicle of a business or a community organization. You're here today to watch them present their work They've been working very hard over the last six months to refine their business models, their pitches. They've been working with mentors, coaches, and consultants um, to really get to the point to where they're ready for investment and partnership. So I have a few asks for you. The first is, as you're watching them present, please think about how you as an individual or your organization can help, can help them, whether that is through financial support, grant funding, private investment, by making a connection to someone you know in your network, or maybe simply by talking about them to your friends. We all have a voice in this. The other ask I have of you is that as you're absorbing their stories and thinking and spending time with this wonderful community that we've gathered here today, is to please, let's think about this question. Can Washington be the next global hub for the circular economy? I'm relatively new to the area. I just moved to Seattle about a year ago now. And I've learned that, yes, we are green, we're environmentally friendly, but we're also innovators. We're builders, we're growers, we're artists, we're tech geeks. So why not? Why can't Washington be the next global hub for the circular economy? I really hope that today is going to be a step in this direction of achieving this big ambition. And thank you for all your consideration and time. I'm now gonna hand over to um, Dan Felton, who is gonna be introducing our keynote speaker. Thanks all. Thank you, Asima. Quick show of hands, did anyone wake up this morning thinking they weren't gonna wear any clothes today? Anybody? No, I'm guessing by the look of the audience here, I think you all woke up probably thinking, what am I going to wear today? Well, I'm that guy who wakes up every day thinking about packaging. I'm Dan Felton with the American Institute for Packaging and the Environment. I wake up thinking, is it important? Does it have value? Do we need it? How do we need it? And I'm going to talk briefly about, is there a life for that packaging after the first time or the second time or the third time it's used? So if you're not familiar with AmeriPen, we are a trade association that represents the packaging industry in the United States. We uh, advocate on behalf of the packaging industry, material suppliers, 
packaging manufacturers, of brand owners who use that packaging. And super important to today is those who reclaim and recycle that packaging at its end of life. That's a very important part of the fabric of AmeriPen. We have a state recycling market development task force that talks about how to address packaging at its end of life. We are a proud member of the Washington Recycling uh, Development Center on the board for that group. A shout out to Kara Stewart and the great people at Washington Ecology and the work they're doing. If you're from Washington, we're paying attention in the last few weeks. We had packaging legislation under consideration in the Washington legislature. Unfortunately, it's important. Unfortunately, we didn't get it across the finish line this year. But we're going to be back next year working on that because as we talk about the circular economy in Washington state, things about packaging producer responsibility, all that sort of stuff is fantastic. And I want you to know that American is deeply committed to having that circular economy discussion. We're also very proud partners of RRS, who's deeply involved with Next Cycle. We released a report in 2021 about the best practices for state recycling market development centers. Um, we're very happy for that collaboration. We have another report coming in about six weeks about the economic value of state recycling market developments. There's a driver here for the economy, for jobs, for new businesses. So we're very, very passionate about that. If you want to learn more about AmeriPen, go to AmeriPen.org. More importantly, though, I'm here to announce your keynote speaker today and have her come up to the stage. Ambika Singh is a dynamic entrepreneur and the founder of Armoire, a leading women's clothe, clothing rental service. After graduating from Dartmouth College and the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Amaka worked in the technology industry and consulting before realizing her true passion for empowering women through fashion. In 2016, she launched Armoire, a subscription-based service that allows women to rent designer clothing and accessories for a fraction of the retail cost. Armoire focuses on serving ambitious women with their service, making it convenient and delightful for members to look and feel their very best. Armoire's inventory includes a wide range of designer clothing from both well-known and emerging designers, making it easy for Armoire's members to experiment with their style and try new trends without committing to a long-term purchase. The company's focus on sustainability and reducing waste has made it a popular choice for customers who are looking for eco-friendly alternatives to traditional fast fashion. With a growing customer base and a commitment to providing high-quality, stylish clothing, Armoire is quickly becoming a new leader in the fashion rental industry. Under Armoire's leadership, I'm sorry, under Ambika's leadership, Armoire has grown rapidly and gained national attention for its innovative business model and commitment to sustainability. The company has been featured in Forbes, Vogue, and the New York Times, and Ambika has, recognized, has been recognized as a rising star in the fashion industry. Ambika is dedicated advocate for women's empowerment. She has spoken at conferences and events across the country, sharing her story and inspiring others to pursue their passions and break down barriers. In her free time, and now I'm realizing here, got to get her up on the screen here. There you go. Sorry about that. She has spoken at conferences and events across the country, sharing her story and inspiring others to pursue their passions and break down barriers. In her free time, she enjoys hiking, skiing, and exploring the Pacific Northwest with her family. Without further ado, please welcome my new friend, Ambika Singh. Thanks so much. I very much appreciate that warm introduction. So I'm going to take you on a little mental journey here. What if those jeans you were wearing right now were rented? What if I told you your ski pants could be rented? A vintage Chanel bracelet. How about your stroller? What about your furniture? Would you start to contemplate maybe what else you could rent? And really, what is the blurry line between owning things and renting things? If you own your house, Thanks to a big fat mortgage, do you really own your house? Do you need to own your house? I wanna suggest that ownership has been a very important part of our society for a long time. If you think about what separates us from our animal friends, you see it everywhere. 
I see it in my little 18 month old claiming dominion over his toys. This is mine. This belongs to me. But it's questionable whether that measure of success really translates into our modern world. The things that we owned used to have utility. We needed them, our tools, our fire makers, our homes. They also had status associated with them. The more stuff we had, the more resources we had, the better our families were doing. Those things have started to erode from the necessity of having them. And I want to suggest that perhaps one of the difficulties about translating how we think about ownership into this new, perhaps, idea about experience is how do we measure ourselves in that context? If we don't own these things, are we really doing well? Are we successful? Where is the measure of how the family's doing. If we started to try to think about taking that apart, how would we measure ourselves? So not too long ago, I was an MBA at MIT, as my friend Dan mentioned, uh, in a room very much like this. It was 2016, pitch showcase. I had a small idea. I thought about this idea of ownership and did it matter? And did I have to own all of my things? And could I be sharing my things, particularly my clothes? Um, it is really an honor for me to be here uh, because I am so close to the entrepreneurs in your seat. So I hope today to tell you a little bit about Armoir and give you a little bit of my advice about what I have learned over the last six years. Armoire is a membership-based clothing rental service, and it is built to serve the ambitious woman. Our customers are busy, and they're values-oriented, and they care about their families and their communities and their companies, and we wanted to deliver something to them that gave them that same feeling of delight and happiness when they put on this crazy jumpsuit or the wild coat that I was wearing without weighing them down from possession perspective and giving them the lightness of knowing that their worth was not measured by the sum of their possessions, but instead the experience that they were having and the clothes that they were wearing. Circularity is the platform upon which we are building this amazing business. And it gives us a lot of advantages that may not be apparent right from the outside. The first thing circularity gives us is a deep understanding of our customer. If we were selling our clothes to our customer, we would have, at, by industry standards, a couple touches with her every year, even as our best customer. But because our customers are experiencing our clothes and not owning our clothes, we have eight, nine, 10 touches with her every month. And she tells us about how that is going. Do the clothes fit? Does she like them? This builds a personalization model that is extremely powerful. We know our customers better than anybody else. We know what fits her. We know what kinds of things she's trying to explore. And this helps us turn this important wheel in e-commerce called knowing your customer. The second thing that circularity gives us is a long-term relationship. Our customers, because we're not filling up her closet with durable stuff, have a long-term relationship with us that is more based in a service versus a product. Our clothing is a service to her. It comes to her, she enjoys it for as long as she wants. And when she's done with it, she sends it back to us. And somebody new in this audience might be wearing it the next day when you see her. That's a really important business concept because I acquire that customer just once. And I continue to service her, hopefully for the rest of her life through maternity, through nursing, through size changes, I continue to be the source of her experience of her clothes versus this sort of durable product that I might be selling her every time and having to reacquire her every time. The other place circularity becomes very important 
is in inventory purchasing. So retail businesses uh, are often plagued um, by the complexity around inventory purchasing. So do I have enough? Do I have too little? What does my customer really want? But coming back to that power of circularity, because we know so much about our customers, we're able to really leverage a uh, pretty sophisticated inventory buying model that is fed by this customer data that comes from the fact that, again, our touch with her and our relationship with her is long and it's durable. And because of that, our understanding of her is very deep. Circularity gives us a great toe into digital physical fusion as well. Physical stores are often plagued by the challenge of monetizing the footprint. How do I get enough people into this store frequently enough to actually make this footprint make sense? Again, with circularity, because we have this deep relationship with our customers where she is experiencing with us versus owning from us, she comes to visit us a lot. Uh, and the other uh, lovely byproduct of the digital physical fusion is when she comes to us, it also reduces our carbon footprint. So that was a bunch of what? This is what Armoire has evolved into, and I'm very proud of it. Uh, I wanted to give you a few tips on the how, especially for the entrepreneurs in the room. I think there's three things that I've learned um, that have helped me go from pitch showcase to uh, where we are today. Number one, fight inertia. Number two, sell stuff. Number three, find your passion because it will drive your insight. Inertia is a powerful thing. You're in this room today because you're used to doing well. You probably have a routine. You wake up every day. You get out there. You work your butt off. You execute on whatever the thing is in front of you. And it's really hard to reverse that. So if you're an entrepreneur and you're trying to figure out how do I make sure that I dedicate myself to this thing that I, I know inside? I have this passion for doing. There's a good shot that the business is there and I have a need to deliver this to this world. My advice to you is you've got to figure out a way to arrest the inertia in your life. And so a couple of tactical things that I did uh, to help me um, arrest the inertia in my life. So number one, I physically forced myself to change my routine. I left corporate America and I found a bunch of co-founders who were my team. So now I had some accountability, somewhere to show up every day that wasn't my job. Uh, and this helped me kind of dive in deeply into this thing that I really wanted to do. The second thing is that I constantly, even today and hopefully forever, try to rethink the things that I know to be true. Part of inertia is it puts us on a track um, and it helps us kind of like keep reinforcing the things we know to be true. But for all of you who run small businesses, you know that reinforcing the things that you knew to be true yesterday is not really helpful. <laughs> you got to teach yourself to rethink those things so that you can be agile enough to understand how today is different than yesterday. And the last thing is that creating rhythm in your new life uh, is something that you have to constantly revisit. So Armor is in a really interesting inflection point right now. Um, I, I call it hand-to-hand -hand combat. That's where we were uh, selling things to anyone who had talked to us. I'll talk about that next. Um, you know, the whole family's involved. Everybody's got a role. We're doing whatever we can with the small resources that we can. Today, we have 72 people um, in our uh, small company. Um, and uh, Hand-to-hand -hand combat is no longer the, uh, the rhythm that we really need. And so we're learning how to build process um, and predictability and make sure we have accountability and communication patterns. And all of that is a new rhythm that I'm learning to um, understand and, and put in place. And I think this is an important part of like the continuing that mindset of how do I make sure that inertia is not taking me to the same place that I was yesterday. My second piece of advice is to sell stuff on day one. So here's why. 
I think a lot of businesses and particularly the entrepreneurs that run them, we tend to be optimistic and enthusiastic people, excitable. You gotta make sure that somebody beyond you thinks that your idea is worth buying. <laughs> and the reason I think that that's so important is because I think there's a lot of um, discussion about product market fit. And you should certainly make sure you do all the research that you can and all the customer interviews. But eventually, if you're running a for-profit business, that credit card has to come across some kind of payment platform and end up in your pocket. So swallow your pride and start selling stuff on day one. And I snapshotted these text messages from my real phone to give you a sense for what that hustle looked like for me and continues to look like for me. On the left side is our very first customer who also happens to be my very good friend who just asked if she could merely borrow a dress to go to a wedding. And I said, yes, you may for $149. <laughs> And that was our very first transaction. And it, we haven't stopped since. The second screenshot is another very good friend of mine. And you can tell she's really struggling to use this product that really doesn't work super well at this point. <laughs> and I'm still taking her $149 and struggling through the text to feel like I am uh, delivering some sort of value. But the reason that I highlight that is because this customer who's now paying you money is going to give you a lot more tangible feedback about what that experience looks like because she's got a reel in from her wallet as well as being your friend and loving you. Number three will tell you about how I drove these packages all over the Northeast myself. Um, and parked in all kinds of fire lanes to deliver them into people's offices. But part of the value of that is it gave me very good immediate touch on how this thing was working. I could see if somebody opened the package and it just wasn't what they were expecting. Or if the packaging, where's my packaging friend? <laughs> the packaging wasn't lighting up their eyes. Or, you know, if the clothes weren't fitting, all of that being in that sort of like, really sales forward mindset um, helped me to understand whether uh, I was going down the wrong path or not. My last screenshot is to um, just drive home the hustle point. This is clearly a woman I have met in a Uber pool <laughs> who's probably trying to like text her friends or listen to a podcast or do something else other than talk to me. Hi, hi, um, I run this company, it's very small. I would like to rent you your clothes. I don't want to rent my clothes. Are you sure? Maybe you could just give me two minutes of your time and I could pitch you this idea. Um, and I did that then and I still do that now. And I think it gives me a lot of insight about how uh, customers are perceiving us. My last piece of advice is to find something you are deeply passionate about. Small companies are like David and Goliath. We have less people, less resources, crazier ideas, and you have to find something that consumes your idle mind. That blurry line between what you're doing for work and what you're doing for your life has to be blurry because you have to somehow extract more insight, more brain power from a smaller pool of resources. And so my advice is to find something that consumes you and find other people who feel the same way because that's the way that you will get to outsized insight beyond what your limited resources would otherwise allow. So as a final kind of like point of closing, particularly about passion, I am six years in. Let me tell you a little bit about what my last couple of years have been like. In 2019, we grew 350%. In February of 2020, we had our strongest financial month to date. And in March of 2020, I was raising a Series A with very little cash in the bank, playing for broke. Uh, and you can imagine what had come next. And now, tens of millions of dollars later, we are rebuilding the company in the shadow of bank failures, global unrest, <laughs> a little bit of a looming recession. And yet, 
I continue to feel equally passionate as I did on the first day because the problem is fascinating. How are we going to deeply change the way people think about owning versus experiencing? This, this is my passion. Yours will be something else. But it's something that you are willing in the Uber pool to poke the person next to you and say, hey, I've got this idea. Can I tell you a little bit about it? It's the thing where you will seek out new friends who have something kind of adjacent that they're doing that they might be able to collaborate together or they might just be willing to listen to you a little bit. But it's something where inside you are like, this is fascinating. There's something here for me to explore, to uncover. Bringing us back to the ownership idea, because again, this is my passion. As a child of immigrants, I have distinct memories of my parents clipping the consumer reports and the coupons, thinking about how these possessions that we had, were, we were going to take back to India and make sure like we took them everywhere and we had the things that we had to have. Undoing that sort of thought process is going to be our generation's challenge. How will we recast our self-worth? in the ideas of experiences. Instead of retail therapy, what happens if you and your friend go for a walk? Maybe you enjoy an ice cream. Do you get the same sort of passion and feeling of satisfaction as you did if you went shopping? I'm gonna suggest yes, but I would love for you to try yourself. Try to experience the lightness and start with your closet. Try not buying things for a week, a month, a year, maybe more than that. The end of ownership, my friends, it's here. Thank you. Thank you so much to Ambika, Ashima, Dan. You did an excellent job kicking this off, you know, bringing passion to the room. And um, I'm here to kind of transition to the next phase, kind of the, the meat of this uh, program today. And so I, I do have some housekeeping and some logistics to cover. So kind of put that inspiration in your pocket. We're going to hear a little bit more in a few minutes with uh, all of our teams that are pitching today. And I'm just going to cover some, some of the basics. Um, if you haven't already, and it hasn't been a problem so far, turn off your sound notifications on your phone. Um, if you do go in the lobby, please be quiet during the pitch. I know this is a long full day event, and if you have breaks, that's understandable. If you have phone calls you have to take, that's understandable. Just please you know, be cognizant of, of who's in the room and, and, and not be disruptive. Um, as we're doing the pitches, there, this is a very tight timeline. We have 14 uh, pitches to get through through the rest of the day. We have to stick to that timeline, and so there's no public Q and A. We would love to, you know, hear everyone's thoughts about all these um, great ideas and businesses and organizations. But um, for for now, you'll have to wait for one of the breaks, lunch, or the reception later in the day um, to, to to talk to these folks. Um, there, you will have the opportunity to have your voice heard um, at the end of the day, after the final pitch. There will be a poll where everyone in this audience will be able to vote on their favorite pitch. And um, there will be an award for that, a People's Choice Award. So you'll have your voice heard that way. Um, when, in order to keep this timeline, we have some procedures in place. And so we have a little chime bell. Liz, you wanna just like make that sound real quick? Yeah, so when you hear that, we're gonna start clapping. So let's, let's practice, yeah. Um, and that's gonna happen for during the pitches and during the Q&A. Seven minutes for the pitch, five minutes for the Q and A. We got to keep it moving, and uh, an applause is a nice way to kind of usher them off of the stage. Um, when we're in the lobby and in between breaks and sessions, you're going to hear a, a bit of a more of aggressive bell, almost like a dinner bell, and that's gonna that's gonna be your cue to get back into your seats again in order to kind of keep this program on track. It's going through you know six o'clock, and we don't want to keep you late any later than that. We already feel very honored to have your attention for this long and, and we don't want to 
um, have anymore. So, um, so yeah, those are the main housekeeping. Oh, there's one other note. Um, the cups that we're using that are being provided, those are reusable cups and the lids as well. So just make sure they go into bins uh, listed for reuse, not in the recycling bin, not in the trash, not in the compost. Um, so just a reminder there. Um, I do want to thank sponsors. Um, in addition to the program funders that Ashima uh, mentioned, there are a number of sponsors that, that sponsored this event, Dan being one of them with the Maripan and the rest of them listed here today, many of which you'll, actually all of which you'll, you'll hear about for the different items that they sponsor. But I do want to give an initial shout out to these great folks that are helping to make this event um, what it is uh, for all of us. Um, for the agenda, we're going to go right here into the upstream uh, pitch showcase. And actually, we are right on time, even though we got a little bit of a late start. So uh, good on everyone on that front. Lunch is across the quad in a different building. So that's a little bit of a, a kind of wonky part of today. And so again, like when people are going to ring the bell with 10 minutes to go, that's a cue to kind of like get get back here. Um, and, uh, and but we wanted to provide enough space for y'all to to eat comfortably. Um, after lunch, we have the downstream pitch showcase. And then there's a networking reception followed by an award ceremony. And I'll explain a little bit about upstream downstream in just a moment. Um, we have raised, this is part of the sponsorship. We've raised over $27,000 in awards to go to these teams today. So um, yeah, so there's a little meat on the bone to uh, inspire and, and, and get great performances here. Um, and I do wanna just say that the teams that I've worked with for the past six months have been incredible. They've grown, their ideas have, have crystallized, and I'm really excited for you all to hear their pitches today. They've done a phenomenal job. Um, so when we say upstream, downstream, here's a little description. You know, circularity is a continuum, and McKenna, you reminded me that earlier today that, you know, this, this notion to split it up, you know, is, is, is maybe a little bit arbitrary. However, we uh, are doing that in order to keep like-themed uh, teams together. And, and pitches together. So upstream are those that, um, when, you, when you're thinking about the circular economy, that's focusing on waste prevention, reuse, share, repair type models. Downstream are those more traditional concepts of recycling, composting, things that you do at the end of life for a product. Um, so that's how it is organized that way. And so with that, I will invite Liz and Christy up to kick off the upstream pitch portion of this program. Thank you so much, Bryce. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Christy Chow. I'm with Cascadia Consulting Group, and I am one of the co-leads for the Upstream Track. I'm with Start, with Start Consulting Group, and uh, I am also one of the co-leads with Christy on the Upstream Group and honored to work with our great teams. Uh, thanks again so much for joining us for this exciting showcase. We've had the privilege of working for about half a year now with some incredible teams that you're about to see. Um, they have been contributing and will continue to contribute to Washington's circular economy in a very big way. So um, very excited for you to see uh, their projects. So just as a little overview, each pitch is going to be seven minutes for each team. And then there's going to be a quick Q&A from the judging panel. Up front here, we have our wonderful judges, which will be introduced in a moment. And then um, they're competing for a $10,000 award uh, for the top upstream award. So there will be also be the People's Choice Award at the end that Bryce mentioned. Thank you. I'm honored to uh, present our judges. So we're uh, so grateful to have Heather Trim with Zero Waste Washington as our one of our judges. Jocelyn Coro, oh, I always see your name. That's name right. Okay, uh, with Bold Reuse, formerly GoBox, but taking it to a whole new level. Uh, Vin Valentino with the Seattle Office of Economic Development and Moji Egun with Blue Daisy Consulting. And we've just been so fortunate to work with these folks throughout our whole process of upstream um, of coaching our upstream teams. And so just a quick lineup. So first we have Gear Garage, then Just Right Byte, South King Tool Library, Okapi Reusables. Then we're gonna give you a little bit of a break because we know y'all have been sitting for a while and then we'll come back fresh with Community Gearbox, uh, Redesign Collective, and then um, end with the Refugee Artisan Initiative. And so now I would like to present to you our first team that's going to be pitching is Gear Garage, which is a peer-to-peer -peer outdoor rent, uh, gear rental service um, focused on just making the outdoors more accessible by making um, 
outdoor items and equipment more accessible. And so without further ado, I'm very proud to present Adam Wise. Good morning, everyone. I'm Adam Wise, the founder and CEO of Gear Garage. I'm looking to create a world where our wild places are accessible to anyone. Because the more people can climb a mountain or see an alpine lake for the first time, the more people will care about our environment. Here you can see a picture of me standing at the top of Mount Adams in Southern Washington. The gear in this picture and what I needed to get to the top of this mountain costs between two to $3,000. That's a lot of money. Outdoor gear is prohibitively expensive. If you're looking to go on your first backpacking trip, it'll cost you $1,000 or more to get the gear that you need. And if you do make that expensive purchase, it'll typically end up sitting on your shelf unused for the majority of its life. That tent sitting in your garage took 80 suppliers to manufacture. That is a huge waste of both money and resources that eventually end up in our landfills. Even with how much, how expensive gear is, people spend a massive amount of money on it every year in the U.S., $63.2 billion worth of spending, in fact. And Gear Garage is perfectly positioned to enter, disrupt, and grow this market. People are going outdoors more than ever before, especially millennials and since COVID. And the outdoors is also more approachable now due to things like social media, which allow you to find trails more easily, and technology like Garmin InReach that lets you know where you are in the backcountry. And finally, rental is the future, and retailers know it. REI and Eddie Bauer, to name a couple, are doubling down on rental specifically. But their models aren't as efficient as they could be. Enter Gear Garage. We're an outdoor gear rental marketplace that quickly matches renters with lenders who have the right gear available in the right place at the right time. You can see here a screenshot of our rental experience where our renter specifies the types of equipment that they need. But that gets into what makes Gear Garage different. When people use Gear Garage, they get matched with someone that has everything that they need. They click a few buttons, they say what they need, and then we find them someone optimal in the community who has everything for that next camping trip. And in the process, we're creating a new type of marketplace for the sharing economy of things. I've been beta testing Gear Garage with real renters and lenders on GearGarage.com for the last three years in the Seattle market while working a full-time job as a product manager at Microsoft. Here's what I've learned. Renters need gear last minute. 40% of the orders I received, people need the gear today or tomorrow. Additionally, renters are flexible. When you're going camping, most people, they just care that they have the equipment that meets the needs to do that activity. They don't care about the brand or the model of that equipment. Additionally, people are okay picking up equipment from multiple lenders because oftentimes you might need 10 to 15 pieces of equipment to go on your trip. And finally, people love Gear Garage. Here you can see a review from one of our customers that describes our experience as seamless. Compared to the competition, we are more scalable and more user-friendly. Compared to brick and mortar retail and rental, we can get you a lender up the street for a more affordable price. Compared to online retail and rental, we don't have to own inventory and we also don't ship that inventory to customers. And as I mentioned, people need equipment last minute. So shipping isn't really an option anyway. And finally, compared to other peer-to-peer -peer rental marketplaces, Gear Garage does the work to find renters an optimal lender for them. They don't have to lift a finger. And additionally, we can match people with multiple lenders as well if they need a lot of equipment. So our first secret sauce is our product, which provides a seamless customer experience. Our second secret sauce is our go-to-market strategy. 
As a marketplace, it is paramount that Gear Garage can guarantee orders on day one of launching in a given market. In order to do this, we're going to buy the inventory that we need to seed every market that we launch in. We're going to buy that inventory and we're going to give it away to people in exchange for them becoming initial lenders on our platform. We're going to give this gear away to the very people that can benefit the most with Gear Garage, those that can't access the outdoors to begin with. Using this model of seeding the market with inventory, I can launch and scale a market, specifically Western Washington here, in two years to become profitable. I'm going to purchase gear to seed the market, and then I'm going to turn up the marketing expenses that we have to scale the market with supply and demand staying in line. I'll also mention that business is seasonal and we'll be adjusting our spending to reflect that. And finally, this is showing you the trajectory just for Western Washington. We can launch this in every city around the US and that leads to exponential growth. So I'm looking to raise $300,000 as a seed investment specifically to scale up the market in Western Washington. After that, I'm going to use, I'm going to either reinvest the profits from this first market or raise additional financing to launch in subsequent markets around the US. I'm going to put this money towards inventory to seed the market, towards marketing, specifically to do digital advertising and content creation, towards product development, and towards operations to ensure that every rental on our platform is seamless every time. So do you want to learn more? I'm Adam Wise the founder and CEO of Gear Garage. You can contact me here or come find me after, after the uh, competition. I'd love to talk to you. Let's create a world where the outdoors is accessible for everyone. Thanks. Uh, great presentation. Thank you. Um, I'm Heather. Um, uh, what kind of research did you do to when you talk about expanding to other states? What, how, why those states? What kind of research, market research did you? Yeah, do? so specifically looking to expand to states that have a burgeoning outdoor culture, along with populations that can support scaling up uh, the market. Uh, and actually, I, I've got a slide. Oh shoot, okay, I have appendix slides, but uh, I guess they got cut up. But yeah. <laughs> Great job, Adam. Thank you so much for that great presentation. My question for you is um, in regards to the number of lenders you need on the platform in order to support um, your scaling. And I'm wondering about your cost per acquisition and if you've considered both for uh, the lenders and the folks that are that are lending from them. Yeah. So right now, um, you know, we're my plan is to seed the market by buying thirty-seven thousand dollars of inventory specifically, which I'll put in the hands of anywhere to fifty to hundred different individuals, and that'll be enough in the Seattle and Western Washington market specifically. And then the plan is, you know, sort of scale up that number depending on the size of subsequent cities and markets that I plan to launch in. Hey, um, I'd love to hear more about your ideal client or customer. Um, you mentioned that you want to make outdoors more accessible, and it sounds like you kind of have to know what you're looking for on the app. I'd love to hear more about what you imagine your ideal customer might be looking for. Yeah, so I think the ideal customer, you know, we've got we've got multiple different personas, right? So there's renters and lenders. So the kind of key renter is, is the person who is less familiar with the outdoors. Maybe they're going camping for the first time, or maybe they you know, don't go frequently enough uh, in order to own equipment. Um, I also get a lot of travelers. So you know, they're flying into Seattle for the weekend. They don't want to bring their gear with them. A lot of concert goers as well. So they're going to the gorge. They're looking to go camping uh, you know, in the gorge campsite. On the lender side, I've got kind of two types of lenders. There's a big bucket of people that are kind of the casual recreationalists, which, you know, they go once to twice a season and they have a huge amount of stuff that's just sitting around. And then I also have, you know, the avid uh, recreationalists, which basically, you know, they've got 15, you know, pieces of equipment of which maybe they have multiple tents, multiple sleeping bags, um, and they might not lend out their, you know, ultra light, super expensive tent, but they're more than willing to rent out the back, the backup stuff. So um, a little unclear on the lender 
makes money and then you take a service fee. So a little clarity on that would be helpful. Yes. So um, when a rental comes in, I charge a service fee for the renter and, and the lender. So a rental comes in for $100. I charge a uh, $40 service fee to the lender. So they would earn $60 off of that transaction. And then on top of the $100, I charge a $20 service fee. So I earn $60 off of a $100 subtotal per rental. And then my second question on that was, um, can you tell us a little bit about some things that have gone wrong and how you've addressed those? Like some- Yeah, so I think a, definitely. So I think a big concern uh, a lot of people have is, you know, how can I be sure that my equipment is gonna be, you know, protected? What happens if there's damage? Uh, and so the way that, uh, I address that as I charge a security deposit for every rental that comes in. And the renter also, I have their card on file and they're fully liable for the market value of the item. But in the hundreds of rentals that I've done in the Seattle market, um, I've only had one problem thus far. So people typically treat this equipment very well. Awesome. Yeah. And along that note, how many transactions have you processed? And tell um, us a little bit more about like what makes them uh, seamless. Experience. Yeah. So um, I, at this point, I've, I've processed close to 200 rentals. My focus has been more on getting the product right. And so bringing in enough revenue through advertisements to the website to learn what I need to scale in, in a way that renters have a good experience and lenders have a good experience and that I can administer the rentals at scale because doing 200 rentals is very different than 10,000, right? And so a lot of work's been done to create that infrastructure and experience. Um, and uh, what was the second part of your question again? Uh, Just a, a little bit more about what, what yes. makes the seamless experience. So the seamless experience is you, you specify the types of things you need and we take that and we have an automated matching algorithm that contacts people and stack ranks them and basically drives to fulfill the order over time as optimally as possible. So in certain circumstances, your order can get fulfilled within 30 seconds to a minute. Sometimes, depending on, you know, if you need 10 to 15 items, that might take a little bit longer. Uh, but we're using automation and iterating on this algorithm to create an engine that drives to fulfill the order. Thank you. All right. Next up, we have Just Right Bite. Just Right Bite offers a healthy and sustainable alternative to mainstream pet food by using insects and regenerative agriculture ingredients to create their products while keeping animals' needs and palates top of mind. So please invite, um, or I will be inviting, but please <laughs> help me welcome Presley and Mallory from Just Right Bite. Testing. Hi, my name is Nolly Morris, founder and CEO at Just Right Bite. And I'm Presley Sweeney, co-founder, operations, and then some. So our mission is to provide ethically sourced, sustainable, and nutritious insect-based dog treats that promote the health and well-being of dogs while preserving the planet through circular practices that minimize waste and maximize the use of resources. Our team is filled with recent University of Washington graduates with degrees in environmental engineering and entrepreneurship and mentors in the food tech space, consulting, and veterinary medicine. We love our dogs. Don't we all love our dogs? Um, but they consume about 30% of the meat produced in the United States. And with pet ownership increasing to 70% of all U.S. households, this has significant environmental consequence. So what we have done is created and striving to create an end-to-end -end pet food line that replaces the traditional meat proteins, think chicken, beef, fish, with a much more sustainable, just as nutritious, and actually more tolerable on dog stomachs, insects. Um, um, so compared to beef, um, just one bag of Just Right Bite treats saves over seven pounds of carbon dioxide emissions, over 600 gallons of water, and 50 square feet of land. Um, if we were to take this one step further and say you were to subscribe to Just Right Bite Treats for a year, one bag every month, 12 bags, you're saving over 80 pounds of carbon dioxide emissions, over 7,000 gallons of water, and 600 square feet of land. If we were to go up to our market that we're trying to hit here in Seattle, millennial pet owners, um, if just every millennial pet 
dog owner in Seattle bought one bag of Just Right Bite Treats, this would be the equivalent of taking 35 gasoline-powered vehicles off the streets for a year. Um, servicing the whole entire city of Seattle with water for four months and saving the land of 43 football fields. So um, currently 98% of pet food packaging ends up in landfills. Um, and that in addition with the massive meat consumption of the of our pets, it just means that the pet food industry is taking a huge toll on the environment. So what we're trying to do here is working on meeting our customers where they're at. We wanna prevent packaging from going into landfills and we wanna provide useful um, resources for them to do so. And while we're doing that, we're really focusing on our internal inputs and our manufacturing, wondering how we can make that as sustainable and circular as possible. So like Mallory said, we love our pets, but we also love the planet. And so we really want to ground ourselves in those values. So when we're looking at our business practices and our circular economy, what we're taking, what we're making, our use and our eventual reuse, we really want to know that where we're taking our things from, we're prioritizing upcycled ingredients when possible. Another really cool thing about our protein, um, insects are actually, or at least the insects that we're sourcing are um, fed with food waste. So that's something that's already been talked about earlier and will be talked about later today as well, but it's filling our landfills with billions of pounds of waste. Um, as well as pollution. And so we're utilizing that protein, utilizing that upcycling of food waste, and then we're making that into our product. And so when we're making our products, we're trying to shorten our supply chain, get everything locally. Our insects are from a supplier in Burlington, um, as well as a lot of our other ingredients are locally, um, locally sourced. And so we're making that, we're really trying to prioritize our circular um, methods within our production, really minimizing our waste, maximizing our resources, and then in our eventual use and reuse. So we're envisioning a circular, um, circular production as well as a refillable and um, really uh, utilizing a refillable container um, or another, and if not, or if we're not able to do that, recycling and composting our containers as well. Um, and so then eventually we want to make this full circular economy. Um, and we are currently working with two groups with the University of Washington Human Centered Design and Engineering Department. Um, and they're actually working with us to carry out market research, as well as prototyping and co-design workshops to really meet our customers where they're at, finding um, prototypes that are they're going to want to use as well as alleviating their pain points while ultimately maximizing our resources and minimizing our outputs. So the pet food market is massive. Americans spent $45 billion in 2020 on their pets. We're specifically targeting millennial pet owners and that 56% of millennial pet owners concerned with their carbon paw print. We're starting here in Seattle, a city notorious for having more dogs than children, to experiment with our messaging and our branding before expanding nationally. Pet food, while there is other companies in the space, there is another company here, Jiminy's, who is an insect-based pet food, but we are integrating circularity into our business and building a community from the ground up, and then also leveraging the fact that we have people in this space socializing novel proteins with our consumers. So our go-to-market strategy is we've broken it up in four phases. Our first phase, we're that little grub. We're moving from phase one to phase two, but our first phase was direct consumer pop-ups and farmer's markets before going into local and boutique retail stores, then going regional before expanding nationally. We've sold about 6,500 to date. That's a little off. Um, and we know that when we get in front of people, we can sell our product. People will pay for our product. Um, and what we're doing... So... Oh, yes. Okay. So our average unit economics is we have a gross margin about 65%. And we anticipate that increasing as we're able to hit wholesale pricing and our production becomes more streamlined. So regarding our financials, we have a four phase financial plan where we are in conjunction with our, um, in conjunction with our go to market strategy, where we know what milestones and how much money we need to fit. And we're going to use um, some non dilutive funding fundraising, as well as organic growth to, to move through this. And we have, we have a 50, we estimate based on past experience, we'll have a 15% growth rate and when it hit profitability in about 2026. Um, so if you believe our ask is we're raising $250,000 to build out our production space and to decrease our customer acquisition costs before launch and launching into our local retail channel and expanding our sales team. 
if you believe Just Right Bite is a solution that you'd like to learn more about, or you're a in the direct consumer space or the pet food market, um, please use this link tree, set up time with us, find us around. We'd love to meet you and talk with you. And we have samples on the table outside if anybody wants to bring them to their dogs. Well done. That was an excellent presentation. I'm excited about your product. Um, tell me about any feedback that you've received from veterinarians or other professional like um, health pet health experts. So because we, so one of the things we've done is we've started with treats because it is a novel protein and there's lifetime sciences being conducted right now. We know that treats and the ingredients that we have are about, should account for about 10% of your dog's diet. Um, and so we have just, there's other, the insect ranches also have the research, but uh, we know that it's equivalent to about an 80-20 beef breakdown when they don't remove the fat from the grubs. And then also the exoskeleton of the grubs is really good for digestion. And so um, because this is new, it's there's a lot of that is sort of, is still being studied in the university level as well as overseas in Europe. But um, it has the amino acid breakdown and the profile breakdown, so it should meet the dog's needs. Um, but yeah. It's also been approved by the governing body of pet food in America um, as a protein source for dogs. And we're expecting that for cats soon as well. Um, say a little bit more about your ideal customer. You said millennials, but you didn't say why. And if you've done any market research to well, my age, you spend a ton of money on dogs. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, um, uh, so we completed so the uh, regional i program last summer where we conducted interviews with potential customers. We've done research um, surveys. Uh, we've just done some secondary research and know that millennials are more likely to um, spend a little more money on the environmental, um, try different novel proteins. We've done research with different, we've had a group, another mentor group where they're like, maybe you're breaking it down on age isn't the best way. So we're with the human centered design group. They're also conducting interviews and surveys and helping us kind of refine that messaging because it's, um, we just, we built our personas based on our customers who have purchased our product. And we know that, um, people who want maybe a more of a luxury item or a sustainable item are, um, yeah, more know. likely to spend. Um, we also have, so we have three ideal personas that we've created. One is the millennial person who loves the environment, loves their dog, um, as well as the gift giver is another thing for the people who don't have dogs, but want to support or want to encourage the people that they love with dogs to kind of support the environment um, and make a sustainable choice, as well as the luxury pet owner who's maybe their kids are off at college and now they have a lot more money to spend on their dogs, that kind of thing. Um, so we have thought about that. In Hi, I'm wondering if there are any um, differences, disadvantages in terms of like storage length. You mentioned that it's a shelf staple product, but I'm wondering if you know, it lasts less long or are there any differences between regular treats? So we dehydrate our product to have less than 9% moisture activity. So it is shelf stable for at least a year. And then going forward in our products, we want them to all be dehydrated or freeze dried so that you don't have the additional cost of storing it in the refrigeration. And the refri we don't have to ship it in any sort of um, packaging that may be more heavy or may need to require more insulation. Can you talk a little bit more about the like insects. I saw a lot of very cute grubs up there. Yes. So. We use black soldier fly larvae and we're also uh, looking at mealworms as, as they become approved for dogs. Yeah, they've been approved overseas in Europe. So it's, we expect that to happen soon, but um, those are the two that we're using. So I didn't hear you talk very much about the um, price point of your product relative to other similar. Talk a little bit about kind of what research you've done, where you're kind of going with that. Yeah, pricing is, um, I think it's always evolving. Like we wanted to make sure that we built into our margin that we are able to, I think we go back. Oh yeah. Um, to make sure that we can account to make sure people are, who's making our product is paid a wage that is uh, livable. And one of the other things is we are switching our manufacturing process to be more automated. So we should be able to bring our price point down and it's there's pricing is sort of something we're still experimenting with. And we are anticipating that we'll have a smaller, like treat one, like just bite-sized pieces, maybe not in the cute shapes so that we can see where the, um, like how fast that will move. 
Yeah, I'll also say that our initial um, push into retail is going to be locally owned, kind of the boutique pet store. Um, and in stores, storefronts like that, the higher price point is more common. Um, so what we compared to here is a Jiminy's, which is another insect based brand, and then Purina and Blue Buffalo, which are obviously huge um just huge companies that are able to produce at such a price. Um, but a lot of our more direct competition that is more closely related to us falls in that price point as well. So are these price points for the same weight? How, how is this compared? It's the weight, price? yes. Thank you, Mallory and Presley. Oh, no. All right, next we have the South King Tool Library, also called uh, or Skittle. Um, and they're uh, a really amazing nonprofit that is working to um, provide equitable resources in the sharing economy in um, South King County. And um, right now they're working on a really cool project called the Tool Library Innovation or Incubator Program or TULIP. Um, and I'm so proud to uh, introduce Amanda Miller, the Executive Director, and Mark Strong, a uh, board member with South King Tool Library. Destiny. Hello, everyone, and thank you for your time and attention. This is, this is Amanda Miller, and I'm Mark Strong. And today you'll hear from many amazing businesses, but I'm fairly certain we're the only global movement making an appeal today. We may not be who you think of when it comes to tools and repair, but that's exactly what empowers us to, that's exactly what suits us to empower folks who are not traditionally in those roles. We are part of the South King Tool Library, or Skittle, as Liz said. <clears throat> an equitable and innovative approach to tool lending and waste reduction. We're here today to share our newest development, the Tool Library Incubator Program, or TULIP. TULIP is our strategy for facilitating the success of tool libraries who are starting out or looking to expand. To paint the full picture of our mission, we'll need to give you a little background besides explaining our original acronyms. Our tool library is just like it sounds. You check out tools like you would books from a traditional library you're all familiar with, except then you get to use those borrowed things to transform the world around you. Before it was trendy to share rides or rent out your home, we grew up learning that you could borrow a cup of sugar from your neighbor to maybe make a cake. So why not a drill to build a bookcase? Tool libraries allow residents to borrow <laughs> tools without the burden of purchase, storage, or maintenance. Sharing in abundance helps participants to reduce waste, reduce consumption, and promote sustainability, all while supporting economic and social resilience. Tool lending programs developed from neighborhood associations, sustainability groups, and libraries themselves. But we knew our approach needed to be intentional in our diverse region. Our nine-year journey had lots of turns, but that's another presentation. We opened the doors of our Federal Way location in 2020 and incorporated programs that included recycling, clothing swaps, and hands-on workshops. We know Skittle has found great alignment. <laughs> Sorry, we know, we know Skittle has found great alignments and success be, through all of our programs because we're still here. <clears throat> Since 2020, we've created a huge community cost savings, diverted tons of waste, and prevented carbon emissions equal to more than 53 tons, or five car trips around the earth. With help from a few hundred volunteers, we've worked to complete thousands of checkouts of tens of thousands of tools. <clears throat> we've also been able to connect with dozens of tool libraries around the world for inspiration, direction, and innovation. With tool libraries on nearly every continent, there's actually an abundance of information on how to get started, but those resources are scattered, outdated, and sometimes in desperate need of adaptation to a local's community, local community's needs. 
Um, so the inventory in workshops of Iceland, for example, might not be as applicable to a budding tool library in Ghana. So think for a moment what a tool library in your community might need. Um, maybe I fix it kits, sewing machines, wheelchairs. Um, how would you manage volunteers, donations, fiscal sponsorships, policies, contactless pickup? These are just a few examples of what we have directly heard from organizations and individuals setting out to start their own tool libraries and why it was a struggle for us to open. Throughout our development, I kept sharing with our team, this is hard because this has never been done before, not here and not now. We started to think, what could a coordinated plan to reduce redundancy look like? Sharing, training, and empowerment are the core beliefs at Skittle. We are successful because of our comprehensive approach to tool lending and events that connect the community. Ultimately, everyone wins if they have access to a tool library, but we can't simply copy the same type of organization across different communities. Our model would engage those that want to start a tool library, organizations that exist but want to add tool lending operations, or tool libraries that want to expand their programming equitably. We will streamline the processes as we synthesize resources, customize to scale for different organizations, and serve communities' needs directly. We'll address topics that typically throw organizations off course in a three-phase process. First, we'll create an online course with modules to address tool, establish, tool library establishment, expansion, and economic sustainability. Second, we will develop the mentorship periods for participants to create a targeted approach with their community needs at the center. Third, we'll update resources and develop a process to streamline and increase access. Throughout, we'll leverage grants, donations, and a paid access platform that will grow through scholarships. If the tool library movement has taught us anything, it is that you can't build it for them but you can lend the right tools for the job. The initial launch of the Tulip would be regional, focusing in South King County and similar communities in the Pacific Northwest. While this has global potential, we avoid the one size fits most approach by connecting with community members directly and learning about their specific needs and support networks. Currently, we have a two year development timeline with a trial cohort launching in 2025 and a total launch budget of $266,000. We've already received a vote of confidence from the Night Cycle C grant to build a strong foundation. We've also begun to pursue grant funding that would cover approximately 75% of startup costs and program participants are expected to contribute a portion of those costs as well. But to build an equitable access, we are seeking a 20% donation match or $55,000. Ongoing budgetary needs would be supported in balance with grants, contracts, and donations, as well as uh, this would help maintain and grow the service region of the TULIP. Today, we're here to find the right grant alignments and partners, investors, participants, and uh, nope, that's it. Also, just people. <laughs> yeah. Just like the diverse group of partners uh, that exist with Skittle right now here. All right. By creating customized pathways, we're escorting participants to organizational success. The tool it provides the right tools to create strong partnership network, which is key. Take root with Tulip. How will you help us grow? Join us in a global movement as we address climate change and inequality as an organization that empowers the community. The tool. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Great yes. job. Um, so my question has to do with you too. I'd love to know more about you and your experiences with tools and are you tinkers? I'd just love to know. Well, I'm a mom, uh, so I have to fix things and we have things broken. Um, one of my proudest moments as a parent was my child coming to me and saying, it's okay, I broke this, but we can fix it at a repair cafe, right? You know, when they show that spark of understanding how the true circular economy works, how sharing economy works, how investing in each other works, then I think that's a win for me. Um, I also, you know, taught a chainsaw class yesterday. So, uh, but I grew up using tools and pretty familiar with that whole deal. Mark, do you want to say something? 
I'm cheap. He's also fabulous and just a great guy uh, to, to connect with. So <laughs> cheap is a good thing. Um, so I'm wondering how much the different, so how it would interact with the people who potentially want to start a two library expand? How much would you be charging them and sort of how the whole interaction would work? So as we've established what the, obviously the launch costs are, what the ongoing costs are going to be a little variable depending on what the full scope of what we can provide. Um, what we found an operating budget for our current tool lending program uh, involves staff that would also duplicate in between things. So we are anticipating nothing, ideally, uh, because we would love to have sponsorships, partnerships, grants to fulfill those gaps. I know as we expand to different communities, we've, we're have we actually involved with every level of government under funding at the Skittle right now, and we hope to pursue that and grow it in exponential form um, to, to be kind of cheeky about it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, well done, you too. I love I love the passion that you're bringing to the solution, big time. And I'm a fellow Sawyer, so right on. Um, help us help clarify for us, like what is the primary pain point that you're helping solve with Tulip? So there was a slide back there. I'm not going to try to find it because I'll get lost there. Uh, but it talked about everyday disasters, and that's something that we've come to as of late because there's a growing inequity in sort of the spectrum of of communities and how folks that are, you know, maybe lending fashion and, and gear aren't on the same level as folks that could be completely derailed by their car breaking down. And while that's something that we can appeal to on a, every level, you know, my car might not have started this morning. I don't know. I carpooled. Um, but the idea is that how do we broach these issues without having that be a complete fundamental shift for people and empowering them to be able to, hi, I'm a mom. I'm um, not particularly uh, burly, I don't think, but I can run a chainsaw and you can too, if you need to. Um, I grew up in a place in Southern Virginia where natural disasters happened all the time. Uh, trees went through my house. We would have to use chainsaws to move things, tractors and stuff. So it was natural to me to try to build in a community that was centered around that. Um, so you mentioned at the beginning that you're you're building a global movement and that there's you know differences between Iceland and Ghana. And I'm wondering where you imagine you're going to start. Is there you know alternate languages? What cultural um, differences are you expecting to in incorporate into your product? Absolutely. So we're from South King County. Um, not sure if everyone is familiar, but it is uh, in the same city or same county as King County. But it is a it's a different world, uh, so to speak then there's a huge disparity. Uh, there's huge variety. We live in one of the most diverse cities in actually the country, top 20. Um, but Federal Way has 115 languages spoken in their school districts, and there's a lot of programs. We don't want to reinvent the wheel. People do good work. I do not speak more than one language well, um, so not even then. Um, but the idea is that we want to partner. We've been able to leverage partnerships with a lot of really valuable uh, uh, organizations that do the work. Um, there's organizations that teach refugee women how to drive, uh, the great refugee programs that we have connected with here. And I, really, I see connections with every program upstream and downstream between our recycling events and endeavors and what we do on the upstream to, you know, we, we do, we thought about having fishing poles and things, uh, but it's a, I don't know how to do that as well as I do a chainsaw, so. Um sort of a, a a random question, but on one of your slides, you had a school bus, but you didn't say what that was. So I'm wondering what that was. But oh. um, also, um, what have you had a chance to do market research? And, and if so, what kind of results have you seen? So this is a schoolie. I don't know if you know what happens, but these schoolies are a pretty big movement. I would love to answer your questions later. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. I see that, um, you know, that's inspiration for me. I'm going to start using a chainsaw. I think, <laughs> I think my colleagues would um, ask that I not, but all right. All right. Next up, we have Okapi Reusables. So they're going to come up and talk about the reusable cup network that provides cafes with e an easy way to offer reusable cups to go. So please help me welcome Deb and Emily from Okapi. You want to put some stuff down there? 
the props. Testing. testing. Hi everyone, I'm Deb and this is Emily and we're co-founders of Okapi Reusables. We're a reusable cup network. So our mission is to make reuse the norm by making it easy to get coffee to go in real cups without the plastic, without the guilt. Here's the problem that we're taking on. So 50 billion coffee cups go to trash every single year in the US. So the Space Needle is about 600 feet high. When you stack those behind it, the, that stack is nearly four times the Space Needle. And virtually none get recycled. So we talk about coffee cups and we call them paper cups, but it's actually paperboard with a polyethylene lining, a moisture barrier. So they're pretty tough to recycle. Um, and studies actually show that with hot liquid in these coffee cups, microplastics migrate over the course of 15 minutes. This is, I'm almost done with the bummer part of the show. <laughs> when you add in a hundred, when you add in cold cups, it's 120 billion in total that go to trash every year. Um, and this is a growing category. So three quarters of Starbucks volume is in cold drinks. That was an uh, interesting fact for me to learn. Um, and just as a reminder, so we enjoy these cups for about 15 minutes, but they've come over on container ships, typically from overseas. We use them for 15 minutes, we toss them, they get collected, they get trucked to landfill. So it's energy intensive on the front end and the back end. So on to the positive. So our solution is a reusable clean cup at your favorite cafe to borrow and return. So you see the cups, they're double wall stainless steel cups. They're insulated so your coffee actually stays hot longer um, versus a disposable cup. So it's a really pleasant drinking experience. And we've also got glass cups for cold drinks. So for when the beauty of the drink matters, juices, smoothies, bubble tea. And we purposely chose not to use plastic for both health and environmental reasons. On the cafe side, we try to make it as easy as possible to get started. So we bring the cups to cafes um, at no upfront cost. We provide signs. There's a mobile app for customers to use. And then people borrow and return the cups. We'll show you that in a second. Um, and then cafes wash and sanitize in-house. So this helps us keep a lean operation. We don't have offsite dishwashing. So we don't have that cost of that infrastructure. Cafes do pay us. It's a sort of a pay as you go. So it's equivalent to, roughly equivalent to the cost of disposables. Um, and we basically track the borrows and then we invoice them quarterly. Before we show you the flow on the customer side, um, what a customer does is they download our app, they pay a one-time $10 membership fee, so it's not a subscription, it's just a one-time fee, and then they can borrow and return as much as they like. So let's take a look at a borrow. So this is Fetch Coffee Roasters in Southeast Portland, and the interface is super simple. There's a borrow and a return. You hit borrow, you scan a code at the counter, the logo of that cafe pops up. You show it to the barista and you say, I want my drink in an Okapi cup. You take it away. Come back within two weeks, please. Hit return. And it's the same thing on the other end. You're scanning a code and that tells us that the cup has come back. And you drop the cup in the return bin. And then again, cafes wash and sanitize. So it's pretty simple. So a little bit on traction. We started just over a year ago. We actually tested for 30 days in two cafes. We wanted to see if the app worked. We wanted to try the cups. Um, and we did have a couple bumps. The borrow was not as smooth as we wanted. So we made some changes. Then we launched in four cafes in January. So just over a year ago. And in a couple of weeks, we'll be in 44 cafes in Portland, the Bay Area. And we just crossed over into Washington State with a cafe in Vancouver that's going really well. They're using it even with drive through um, and we did this through the really important support of four grants. We couldn't have done it without the grants. Um, I just want to pause for a second and say, you know, over the course of this year, we've, I mentioned the 30 day pilot because we keep kind of viewing this as a learning opportunity. Um, and I think what we've learned is that this is a model that works. So cafes and customers are willing to pay. Um, we've learned that as we get more density in a city, cafes are joining at a faster pace. So you see the number 44, and that was about 35, like a month ago. So things kind of go faster as you go along. Um, and then last, 
the uh, cafe that was on the previous slide is Clinton Street Coffee House. They were the first to say yes to us, which was so big. And so they've been doing it for just over a year and they have shifted one in three single use cups for coffee to go to either bring your own cups or Okapi cups. Um, and they do that by baristas offering the choice every time somebody wants coffee to go. And they actually also nudge ceramics for dine-in. So they are on top of this. So seeing that one in three cups go to real cups has been really inspiring for, for us. And just full disclosure, that's not happening at all of our cafes, but we try to stay close to cafe owners and staff and we keep learning as we go. Uh, we have an approach that makes it easy for customers and cafes. And our vision now is to expand the network to 300 cafes within the next three years, adding more locations in Portland, the San Francisco Bay Area, and we'd love to expand further into Washington. So we now have that one in three cups as our benchmark, and we want to be part of this conversation to promote both bring your own as well as cut borrowing. So our model includes three major funding sources. So the first is revenue from our cafe and customer fees. So we've priced things affordably for both cafes and customers to reduce the barrier to adoption. Our cafe fee is a one-time $10 membership fee to join. They can then borrow and return an unlimited number of times. For cafes, the revenue is, uh, the fee is priced equivalent to disposables. So it's usage-based. Uh, just based on the number of cups borrowed from their cafe. Um, we did feel like it was important to have while the fees to be low for it to be non-zero. And we see that paying off over time. Um, so, you know, in the next three to five years, then we see um, a more significant portion of our costs being covered by those customer and cafe fees. But it's going to take time for that user adoption to grow. So, which is... What brings me to our two other sources of uh, funding uh, that we would like to develop So, uh, and the areas of our asks. So one is municipal grants and public-private partnerships. So we have had uh, the benefit of grants in the Oregon metro area and the San Francisco Bay area. And we'd like to build on corporate sponsorships as well. Cool. And I really love that you're not using plastic. Wow. That's like A plus. Um, so my question is, um, when you get to that point in 2025, you still are needing 400K of outside support. So muni support or sponsorship. What is your plan to make it even? Because that could dry up. Um, so, you know, we hit a recession, whatever. So what are you what are you thinking in terms of getting to the point where it is actually fully self-sustaining or, or much more self-sustaining? Yeah, we see a lot of things changing by that time. So it's hard for us to project beyond three years, given what might change in terms of the technology. Uh, what we also foresee is as consumers become more aware of services like this, that they start to ask for it. And so right now we're still going door to door to small businesses telling about this having face-to-face -face conversations to explain, you're not buying this. This is something that you borrow. Um, and right now it still really takes that face-to-face -to, -face to, to build those relationships. But over time, as consumers start to seek out products like this, then cafes will be looking for it as well. And so the efficiency to scale will improve over time. We'll be able to get better pricing on our cups we'll be able to also explore what other business opportunities there might be with cafes in terms of what else can we do to, to serve them um, in, from a circular perspective. I'm wondering, you said you don't have any kind of washing hubs or cleaning networks. So what is the conversation with cafes and their staff on that new capacity to them? And the second question is, do you imagine any other type of food service outside of cafes in your projections? Yeah, these projections are focused on cups and cafes, uh, but we think that this bar borrowing model could work for containers as well, um, but it's not been uh, yet something that we have piloted. Um, and in terms of dishwashing, it is a barrier for some of the cafes that we talk to, um, but it's been less of a barrier than we feared that it might be when we first started. 
So as long as a cafe has either a commercial dishwasher or a three compartment sink, then they are uh, essentially following, following the same guidelines as what restaurants do for dine-in ceramics, then they are good to go. And um, we've actually seen that, um, yeah, we've had more luck actually with that than we thought. It's the vast majority of cafes. I would love to know more about um, return rates of cups and if you had any issues with loss of product. Yeah, so our network-wide average uh, return rate is about four days. So that does meet kind of our goals for utilization rates to make sure that the payback on the materials of the stainless steel cup are actually making sense, right? We don't want somebody buy, you know, borrowing cup, never returning it, and then that is worse than a single-use disposable paper or plastic cup. Um, so we've felt pretty good about that. Um, and so our our target audience at this point are folks who are your real cafe regulars. So they are already back at those cafes two to three times a week, sometimes two times a day. And so, you know, that that cup just is, you know, going along with them. So they're not making a special trip to return the cups. Um, and it's not a big, um, big thing out of their regular routine. So in a way, we're just kind of habit stacking on top of something you're already enjoying, which is like your daily coffee. Wait, yeah. right. Yeah. Hi, friends. Huge fan. I uh, love the glass cups so much. Looks great. Uh, tell us a little bit more about your ideal cafe partner and also interested into any calculations you've done around environmental impact opportunity here. Yeah. Um, so our ideal cafe partners at this point are ones who are open to collaborating with us. You know, this is really still learning. Uh, we're in learning mode. And um, the cafes that have made the most difference are the ones that don't mind talking about it to their customers. Um, and while they're busy, you know, they're, they're making drinks uh, and they are just keeping up with the line. And, but when things are slow and they've got their regulars coming in, then, you know, this is something that is pretty easy for a barista to talk about if they're comfortable, comfortable doing it. Um, but we don't want to just serve cafes that have that mindset. Um, you know, we'd like to over time make this a more common social norm. And for even cafes that are not quite comfortable talking about it, but they are willing to participate, you know, we we want them and we want to then build community partnerships with local grassroots organizations, folks who want to talk about it for them, you know, and really kind of pair that so that we are including cafes that are really still focused on their business. And, you know, this is a second business for them to promote. All right, welcome back. Uh, we're, it was a pleasant surprise to get a nice extra break. Uh, so our next presenter, I'm looking, is he in here? Oh, you're hiding over there, okay. Uh, so our next presentation is committed to disrupting individual consumption and Community Gearbox is a social inventory management app that lets users and organizations share, co-own and mobilize resources amongst people they know and trust. I'm so excited to have Dante Garcia come up. Okay. And Kay, and I forgot your last name. All right. Hi, I'm Dante. And I'm Kay. And um, we're both from Community Gearbox, and we're providing an alternative to individual consumption. Despite all the rhetoric we see on the news and social media, more and more Americans want to do their part in taking care of the environment. But simply buying more sustainable products won't save the planet. Um, the real underlying problem is the, amount, and that is the amount that we consume in the first place, especially here in the United States, where our per capita consumption is simply off the charts. If we really want to care for the planet, we're going to need, we're going to, need to advance ways to reduce consumption overall. Fortunately, there are a number of sharing economy solutions on the market that are helping us cut back on our individual consumption, but all of them have the same rub that either limits the quality of goods that you find, 
pushes the cost of the solution up, or keeps people from even trying it in the first place. And that is stranger danger. All these platforms have the same premise, sharing things with people we don't know. This lack of trust and relationships on these platforms is where we're looking to address, is what we're looking to address as a means to further reduce consumption and keep things in circulation. Two years ago, my partner, Sally and I were in a pickle. We had planned and prepped everything for this amazing road trip out to the coast. We had everything in place except for one thing, a car. Not wanting to pay for a week's worth of, of rentals, we got on Facebook and made an ask. And we were blown away. An old college, old college classmate we hadn't talked to in years was quick to respond and lent us their van, which we were able to live out of for over a week, which got us thinking, how can we make more moments like this possible? And how can we make this talent, this latent abundance, visible and accessible? So welcome to Community Gearbox. We're building a social inventory app for people and organizations to gather, share, co-own, and care for material resources amongst people they know and trust. And we're building our product around exactly that. We believe that for sharing to expand amongst more people, trust and relationships within a community um, is essential. And we believe that starting here will allow more people to be open to behavior change and find the joy and gratification of actually keeping things in circulation. And so the time is now. Growing economic pressures are pushing people to find more cost-effective ways to access goods and care for one another. As the climate crisis escalates, more consumers report being environmentally conscious, leading to an emerging appetite for real and meaningful solutions. With that, the sharing economy has matured. Consumers have moved from skepticism to acceptance and are open and dif to different and new ways of keeping things in circulation. Lastly, we see a dispersion of informal sharing efforts across platforms that we believe can be addressed through a formal tool. Taking these factors into consideration, we believe the underlying conditions are in place to bring our product to market. To do this, we are focused on developing our product with two main feature sets using the design framework come for the tool and stay for the network. Our core tool is a set of inventory management features that help people gather and track items. And what enables the network is a set of social features that help people work together and share amongst each other. This year, we've scheduled three main product releases that will move us towards an initial product market fit in Q1 of 2024. Last year, we released a working prototype and saw 300 people jump on catalog more than 2,500 items uh, worth over $100,000 and conduct 50 exchanges. We currently have one letter of intent and two community partners. We are in REI's national startup program called Embark, and we have nine students from Berkeley Innovation and UW's Human Centered Design and Engineering program supporting us through the end of the school year. We believe that our tool has the potential to claim a new market, a new product category at the low end of inventory management enabling people to gather, track, share, and share as a community in contrast to, to traditional inventory management tools, which are geared towards backend management amongst a small team. Our total addressable market is the estimated 70% of US consumers who are trying to buy and live sustainable lives. And our wait list is full of these individuals and homeowners who would like to use it amongst their friends. Based on our interest, based on interest, we believe we'll be able to find early customers and test our products amongst organizations to discover our atomic network and best practices for onboarding communities. With that, we've begun partnering with groups in the climate resiliency space, exploring how our tool can help them asset map and support surge demands after a disaster. And we've also started working with people of color, low income and queer outdoor organizations where both where, where gear limits their programming and participation. To start, we're focusing on product market fit and entering Seattle and then we'll expand and we'll test and expand to other markets across the country. There are a number of alternatives in the market, but none have the features that Community Gearbox has. Instead of trying to convince people to share things with people they don't know, like through rentals, we're focusing our efforts on empowering communities uh, who have a stake in each other's lives. Instead of gathering everything in one place, like a lending library, we're allowing people to build a dis to build a distributed network of goods and track where things are. And instead of solely helping people give things from one person to another, we're supporting groups of people to gather and pool goods to create collective abundance. We're, we're making it so that communities can not just consume, but also care for material goods together. Our business model is simple. Community Gearbox is free to use for anyone who wants to use it amongst friends and family. 
We offer a scalable co-op membership to users who would like additional features that can be used individually or for groups, clubs, and organizations. Further down the line, we'll also provide features such as insurance and coverage for items to be repaired. Lastly, we are already seeing interest and requests for demos from larger organizations, and we look to establish contracts with them. Get that to save time. Our key financial benchmarks are first paying are acquiring first paying customers in the next few months when we get the product back in people's hands. Next, we're looking to break even with around 500 co-op memberships and two large contracts. Third, we'd like to reach 1 million in annual revenue with around 5,000 co-op memberships and 12 large contracts. Please help us. We're currently at raising $100,000 to accelerate our product market fit by Q1 of 2024. And we are looking for patient capital, impact investment, grants, and partnerships that can bring support and knowledge in addition to funding. In this time of excess, we deeply believe that we have enough. So please help us grow the world's largest network of shared and co-owned items by 2030. Very cool. What a cool concept. Um, so I am a little um, not sure how it's going to be financially sustainable. So you say co-op subscriptions, but you didn't say like kind of what your price point is and how that would support and like how much staff you would need to make this happen and sort of the kind of the financial sort of nitty gritty. Yeah, no, that's a really good question. And very candidly, we're still kind of in that early phase where we don't have yet a paying customer. Um, we do imagine that, you know, the entry level will be pretty low around like $5 per individual, um, given that our overhead is pretty small um, and that, you know, we're not having to maintain this inventory or other things like that. Uh, yes, $5 a month, yes. Uh, will be a likely starting point for, for individual users who want that. Awesome, well done. Uh, I'd love to learn more about the R, uh, REI, Accelerator Partnership Program. That seems like a really cool opportunity. Could you tell us how it works? Um, yes, no, the REI program um, is relatively new. They are, over the last year, they've begun to make a commitment to supporting uh, folks of color uh, entering the outdoor market space. And um, we're currently in that program. It's just a three month program, uh, but it's really given us an opportunity and exposure to a lot of different, their network, as well as opportunities to collaborate um, with the other folks who are in that cohort. Um, so you mentioned that uh, stranger danger trust was kind of a big barrier to what people don't share. I would love to hear more about people's experiences with your platform and how that um, helps that. Absolutely. So for us, you know, that was kind of a big aha for, um, for us in that when it comes to sharing, the, the degree, both the quality of goods and the amount of things that people are willing to share shoots up drastically when it becomes people who are within our network and people that we know. And so we're very much interested in, can we build that digital infrastructure that allows people in that space? Um, we just had a working prototype last year that ran for about half the year. Um, it definitely hit the ceiling when we had 300 people on it. Our product slowed down quite a bit. And honestly, we do have a ways to go in terms of really finding that uh, that, that ease in which people are able to exchange things. But in our mind, we're hoping to create a situation and environment for the user where when they turn on this app and they scroll through it, instead of seeing things that, you know, oh, I wish I could buy this, I wish I could have that, they're actually gonna feel a sense of, I actually am a co-owner of everything in here, that, that I have a, a, a stake in these things. And that's what we're hoping to is also imbue that sense of care that usually isn't present on rentals or other things like that. So um, honestly, when I borrow something, I often forget to return it. Um, to, among alone. my friends network and not family. alone. So um, how are you addressing kind of that um, challenge? Absolutely. That was, I think, one of the main concerns that people have, especially given that a lot of people do this already informally. Um, and so for us, having very basic things like notifications, just a reminder that, oh, I'm supposed to return this item or, oh, this is who has that. I think people were really delighted with the fact that when you lend something out, you don't have to worry about who has it. It's mm -hmm. noted there in the product. Mm -hmm. That's clever. Um, I'm wondering about the co-op model that you're talking about. Do you mean it in a in a business structure capacity where pe your people are purchasing ownership shares in the organization and you intend to share out profits? That's a really good question. The last um, business that I built was a worker-owned cooperative, and I know there are consumer co-ops. We're hoping to get into the start.coop accelerator at the in the fall to learn a little bit more about how we might structure this. I went through that program. Let's talk about it. I'd love to know. Yeah, thank you. 
So um, what what has been your most popular items that have been shared in the, in the, in the free mode? Yes, that's a really good question. One of the things that we were surprised about is the quality of goods that people were willing to share. Someone put in their entire adventure van on there. People put like generators and other things that you know you won't see on buy nothing or other interfaces like that. Um, in terms of what was really popular was just outdoorsy stuff, uh, tents, sleeping bags, those kinds of things, um, which is kind of our own initial hunch of a market space we might start in. Do you have any plans to match this digital infrastructure with in-person? You talked about building the sense of community. How does that manifest physically? Absolutely. That's something that Kay and I are actually, Kay's really helping um, pilot this right now, um, which is how do we actually onboard a community in the first place? Mm -hmm. How do we you know, get people there? And so we've been partnering with different organizations to actually do in-person uh, gear drives um, to really kind of spark the imagination and get the product in people's hands uh, to experience what this thing is in the first place. So how would you, I, the, I saw you had insurance. I'm not sure how you were going to make that work. How would that work? You know, that's a really good question. There are already a number of different services and products out there. Uh, one of the other folks, Fat Llama, already has kind of an insured uh, framework around it. So we kind of think of it as like something that uh, we can address as we're able to scale this product, uh, but it will be priced in uh, to people's subscription if that's what they choose. Thank you. <laughs> All right, wonderful. Well, I am happy to introduce Lisa from Redesign Collective. Redesign Collective is a grassroots textile recycling and reuse company here in Seattle, and they, di they divert post-industrial materials and design and manufacturing businesses and upcycle them. So Lisa, take it away. Thank you so much. My name is Lisa Hilbert, and I'm the founder of Redesign Collective. And uh, we are an upcycling company and micro hauler waste management company. And uh, we divert luxury textiles and turn them into beautiful things. Uh, I'm really glad to be back here at the University of Washington. It's my alma mater. And just so happens this hat is made from the base of my old graduation cap. And uh, so I love finding new uses for things and literally turning trash into treasure. And for the past uh, 10 years since graduation, I've been uh, an executive coach for Fortune 500 companies. I also work um, with high school populations as a creative reuse educator to help the next generation with these kinds of um, creative reuse mindsets. And I graduated from UW, but the best thing that happened to me actually while I was here was discovering upcycling. This is a, a gown that I made from refrigerator boxes and packing paper. And it was my first time joining an artist collective. So as much as it was wonderful to learn evidence-based practices for data collection and research here at UW, I think that this was the best skill that I learned. Um, being part of an artist collective and what that means, being a part of a group of people creating a powerful impact. People couldn't believe that what we were wearing was made from refrigerator boxes. There is a power to upcycling that helps people rethink the what they have in their possession. So my studio is in the manufacturing district in Seattle, Soto. And as a dumpster diver, I am always looking for some quality trash. So where, where better to go than just down the street to the most exclusive design community. Every major city has a design center where to the trade only showrooms serve luxury brands, interior designers, architects, and it's not, they're not typically open to the, the public. So I thought, I'm going to go check out what's there. And I saw um, 
about 30 garbage bags in the back of one of the showrooms. And I thought that looks like a waste management problem. And I investigated further and found that the design industry has samples, which due to changing inventory seasons, supply chain issues become obsolete. They cannot be sold because uh, if they're on your showroom floor, somebody might pick them up and then the customer will be very upset when they are when they learn that they can't have that particular pattern. So uh, this waste is so beautiful it, and it's a systemic problem. Um, every month, there are 22,000 tons of these samples hitting showroom floors all over the country. And that's just the furniture showroom category. I didn't go into architecture firms and other places where there are material samples. And these are highly valuable, beautiful pieces that people around the world have put time into growing the materials to make them put the time into weaving and dyeing these materials. And it's a shame to waste even just a little bit of it. So I come and collect uh, from showrooms and I pick up hundreds of pounds of these beautiful uh, fabrics and I take them to my um, hauling vehicle, which is a Fiat with two car seats in the back. And it is Part of, part of the joy is showing people what can fit in the fiat. And uh, then after I, I unpack and weigh the materials, sort them by a variety, a long list of categories, I figure out what they're best suited to become based off of their dimensions, weight, and I design a product and then I take it to a local small batch manufacturer. And part of my decentralized manufacturing model is that more than one business should benefit from my what, what I am providing as, as a business opportunity. A lot of times people try and uh, you know hire everything in, but I think the more that we can pay local community sewists and small batch manufacturers, the more they can grow the capacity in their organizations and businesses. And so by decentralizing manufacturing and turning it into community manufacturing, we are building the capacity also for other parts, the repair and the repair economy. It's all interrelated. So um, that is a picture of the Refugee Artisan Initiative pillows that they make. And then finally, I am tasked to sell. And if you think about the circular economy, which way does the arrow go? It always goes kind of in this direction. And that is reflected in the funding. Funding starts at the top with these big amounts that are distributed uh, in various ways. And as I have been in this process for only nine months, when I see a problem and that I'm not going to be able to succeed, I want to address that problem before continuing. So this is what I call the gap in the circular economy. There is a gap. And in the past six months, I've seen successful heritage upcyclers. People have been doing it 10 minutes, sorry, for 10 years. Um, they're going out of business because of disinformation, greenwashing, and the uh, fake cycling that mass brands are doing, making things from virgin materials that look upcycled. And it's too much. We need. We need people to buy in volume 
and I'm your concierge. <laughs> Let me help you find what you need in an upcycled version. Last year's notebook uh, with the wrong year is now this year's amazing, incredible uh, fabric notebook or any material. I just want all of us to succeed. Thank you. Clearly so passionate about the solution that you're bringing to market. Thank you, Lisa. I love your creativity. Your hat is beautiful and love your dress. Um, okay, so uh, we, I 100% I, I agree with you in, in the circular, circular economy gap, but tell, tell us how, how do you make money and um, how, like, what are your visions for scaling your business? And I also like the distributed uh, co-manufacturing sort of style too. Tell us more about that. Thank you so much. So to, your question is, how do I make money and how do I? Uh, related to that, like what, how did the co-manufacture? Yes. So I've learned that if you want to co-manufacture, there are minimum orders. There are minimum quantities. 200 units is usually a minimum order for a local small batch manufacturer. And that's one of the areas where there is a like this lift issue between small makers and upcyclers who are doing wonderful things with materials, being able to actually scale their work. And I am at this moment collecting materials uh, for free at a, a loss because people who own businesses already pay for utilities and they may not want to pay by the pound, but around the country, some people charge a dollar fifty to two dollars a pound to collect. So that is a model that, with all of the new showrooms that I'm going to be taking on this year, I plan to uh, start the model because I don't want to undercut the value of what all of those other um, micro haulers are doing all over the country. So great. Um, on the the items that you had, where you had the display of the sold of the items you're selling, um, how are you telling the story? And and are, is the price point the same as another decorative pillow, or is it a little higher? How are you what how are you doing sort of the economics and the storytelling on that part? Well, collective. I'm I'm currently trying to reach a customer that appreciates quality and luxury that understands the brands that are not available to buy online, the public does not have access to these materials because only showrooms and people in the trade can place orders. So there, there is, um, there's an access issue that by collecting these materials, I am, I'm resolving that and bringing more high quality, beautiful materials to the public. You mentioned quite a large scale of the problem and I appreciate you calling that out. I, I wonder, I know this was sort of asked already, but as you scale, do you worry about hitting a ceiling with your existing community manufacturers and how do you intend to grow that? Cause it is such a large scale problem. Well, I think, more about replication and less about scale because ideally every community would create its own regenerative ecosystem of people with excess materials and people who can make things and people who can sell things and that there would be an industrial symbiosis created from that. Um, would you be able to repeat the second part of your question? I have already forgotten it myself. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I can give you a, a new question. <laughs> um, you mentioned that you have um, experience with creative reuse and education with high school students, I believe. I'm wondering if you plan to incorporate that into your business at all. Well, that's currently what's funding my business. So I, and you can see my educational display uh, and take a look at the nuances of the problem and why it exists. I would love to be a part of the continuing education of the circular economy 
industry specific to this issue. Uh, but yeah, it is wonderful to work with Gen Z students and being a pandemic toddler mom, having two daughters. I love the fabric, but the deeper meaning about the future and why we need to really be considered about what we consume, how much of what it, the, the educator in me, like if somebody could pay me to just, if I could have a salary instead of working for margin, I would be able to scale what I do. But unfortunately, I have to compete with the linear business model. Um, as soon as you get to that little point in the circle, you have to educate the consumer and yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Lisa. Also, uh, she has that beautiful hat, but also her jacket is uh, embellished with uh, some beautiful textiles. Um, so last but not least, we have Ming Ming Tung Edelman with the Refugee Artisan Initiative, a really great nonprofit organization here in Seattle that gives jobs to refugee women and, and immigrant women and uses uh, just discarded materials to make beautiful products. And Ming Ming is here to talk about her fire hose project. Hello everyone. My name is Ming Ming Tung Edelman. I'm the founder of an innovative nonprofit, Refugee Arts Initiative. I also call it Ray, like a ray of sunshine. I do this work because my background, I'm an immigrant from Taiwan. I wanna give back to my community. And the compassion I've, I've cultivated as a pharmacist over two decades. Also my love of fashion. At the end of this presentation, my goal is for you to support my project of stitching new lives, one fire hose at a time. Our planet is on fire. Literally, if you go back to last October, the sky was filled with smoke. You couldn't breathe and couldn't even go outside. The climate change has caused more frequent wildfires so what happened to these fire hoses when they are no longer functional and are retired at a centralized place, like a size of a football field? We have a contract with the US Forest Department to take as many fire hoses as we want. If we don't take these fire hoses, they actually have to pay a fee to get it incinerated. That means more global warming, a terrible thing. At the same time, do you know that refugee women have the highest unemployment rate? Why in our country? Because the tremendous barriers these women face, language, transportation, childcare. They end up stuck at home, isolated, feeling depressed and anxious. This was a light bulb moment for me in 2017. I recognized that sewing is a universal language. My grandmother was able to put food on the table, raising three kids as a home-based seamstress. And many refugee women know how to sew. At the same time, over 85% of the textile got dumped into the landfill. It was an aha moment. Why not combine the women know how to sew and create jobs and divert waste? I'm proud to say that I have nine dedicated, outstanding staff there to serve these women. From training, for them to connect to other women, start making their first picture in America, and sustainable income. More importantly, giving the flexibility of working from home. Now, since I started six years ago, we have able to be able to create over 120,000 items and divert over 40,000 pounds of textiles. And guess what? We're based known as bag guru because we make all kinds of bags. 
but we want to do more. We are one of the 10 in the, in the world being invited to become ethical handcraft certification organization. This means that we are committed to workers' safety, workers' right, and make sure they have sustainable, fair wages. I can't wait to show you that by this summer, that more our product will have this label. That means that you open up more doors for business partners. So we want to grow our portfolio product by adding fire hoses. Why? They are durable, malleable, waterproof, plentiful, and they're not toxic because they are in wildfire. But guess what? They are dirty. We have to clean them. I'm so thankful that I was able to start this project with the sea money. Oh. Oh. Okay, getting it to time. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> okay. All right, here's the fire hoses. So they have to be clean. We're so grateful that we're able to get the initial money from the next cycle allow us to figure out the logistics of transporting, cleaning, and storage of fire hoses, and allow us to start making some prototypes. So we went and asked you, what do you want from upcycle fire hoses? And here are your answers of 350 of you almost. Guess what? Number one is bags. And remember, we are bag guru. That's a good news. Followed by planters, keychains, doormats, and other items. Here are some examples. You can find fire hose use in your daily lives. You can even carry firewood to your house. And here are some examples in person. So what does it mean we add fire hose to our product portfolio? By 2025, it means that we're able to add more artisans, give them more income, training more women, and less rely on grant because our product sale is going to increase at a faster rate. And we're going to have a revenue total of $1.5 million. We can get to this goal with your help of $60,000. What that means is that we're able to design the most excellent product, training more women, find the equipment we need and get into market all in one year. These are the women of Refugee Arts Initiative, Ray. They are women from all over the world, settled in Seattle, many with children. Your investment of $60,000 will translate into $600,000 of income for these women. We not only empower them to become self-sufficient self to be adjusting their new life in America. You give them hope by boosting their self-confidence and self-reliance. More importantly, your impact goes beyond these women to their families, their children, and the family that left behind in their home country. While saving our planet Earth. So join me be without refugee women seeking a new life, one fire hose at a time. Thank you very much. Okay, I can't go yet. <laughs> Fantastic presentation, Ming Ming. I love what you're doing, how you're doing it. Uh, talk about making lemonades out of lemon. I just, the utilization of the fire hoses and, uh, and your, you know, the resource from the forest service. That's very, very clever use of materials. Um, tell me about how you find the women that you work with and how you onboard them into your organization. Excellent question. I first started, uh, because I was, as I was alumni of UW when they still have university of Washington fashion design, uh, certificate program. I became a really good friend with my instructor and she was teaching refugee women how to sew. 
So the first student actually was uh, from that program. Her name is Toma, she's from Bhutan. And I hired her because there's five other women wanting to start making these necklaces, uh, upcycle necklaces. And I noticed she has problem with uh, walking. It turned out that she had polio uh, contracted when she was at the camp. So she need to be at a home kind of situation. And from that on, um, I got connected with uh, Refugee Women's Alliance and IRC and start working with their case managers. And right around COVID, uh, I was get connected with um, the case manager from Afghanistan and Myanmar. So these are the two, the largest population that work with. And as you know, that because the Taliban took over uh, in 2021, we had an influx of Afghan women we actually went from 14 women last year, now we have 29. And currently we have a wait list of 76 women that want to join the team. And I just heard that this year, by the end of the year, we're gonna resettle 4,000 Afghan family here in our Puget Sound. So I have women knocking on doors every day, say where I am on that number. So your impact of investment cannot allow these women to work, but give them a hope because a lot of them they come here, they, are, they don't know anybody. When they come to our place, they start really shy, not really talk to people. But I saw the transformation from being shy and knowing that their skill can actually become an income and they start opened up. And we have few of them that are able to actually come to our place now to work part-time while the children are in school. So the transformation is immense, knowing that they, their skills are being valued, that they can become the American society. They're not a problem. They're also contributors. So that really made me want to go to work every morning. <laughs> Absolutely fantastic. Um, I'm In terms of the actual uh, material that the fire hoses are made of, what is the material that they're made of? And then have you actually had them tested for toxics? I know you don't have PFAS, but did you actually send them to the lab? And yeah, so um, very, very good question. So the, the fire hose material is synthetic, they're rubber. And what we work with the, uh, uh, actually we contact the Department of Toxicology of Washington, because that will be the first question. Are these safe to be used? Uh, do we need to go to test? Because they are only strictly going through wildfires. They have not contaminated by buildings, other chemicals. So they are, they are not required, they are safe, they have tested. So we were very confident that these can be used in our population. Um, thank you. So I have a question about uh, your target customer. Mm -hmm. uh, is this direct to consumer or do you have like wholesale clients in the works? Well, you have a very good question as well in product development. Today, we might have somebody from Cotopaxi coming here to check us out. So. Anyway, we're very happy to uh, have a partnership uh, with both wholesale and hopefully because of nationification that opens the door for companies that are required to have certain ethical handmade product such as William Sonoma. We haven't even started talking to them yet. So my next question is having to do with sort of your market down the line. This kind of follows on that question. So you have grants and things are supporting now to get to a certain point. Do you anticipate you'll get to a point where the bags would actually pay the full cost because you're doing living wage and you know absolutely so that's why your sixty thousand dollars allow us to finish making the products, <laughs> able to train the women, buy the machine we need, and have the marketing dollar to go there to do outreach. So we're confident that these are unique products with story to tell. As consumer are looking for alternative, that's safe, that want to save our planet, and and. On these cool looking products, I mean, <laughs> we think so. So anyway, we, we think that there's a niche market for this. Um, can you, oh. Thank you. All right, so we are going to be breaking for lunch soon, but before we do that, and I'll be giving a few lunch instructions, we're gonna have a quick, little um, speech from Pat Kaufman of Seattle Public Utilities and Reuse Seattle. Thanks, Christy. Wow, it's so fun to be here. This is my first pitch experience. So I'm just having a great time. Uh, 
So thank you to all the applicants and the contenders and judges and participants. And um, so yeah, talk about Reuse Seattle. Um, we're, we're a group that is part of Seattle Public Utilities and um, we've been working on reuse in addition to recycling and composting for a little bit now. Um, our role is really to help businesses connect. Uh, there's a whole, you know, all the cafes, all the food service businesses out there, they need to move into a different model. The make, take, waste, single use uh, platform of single use packaging is not what we are. Um, we, we see a better way is what I'm saying. Um, of course, we support recycling and composting. We've been doing that forever, feels like, uh, at least 30 years. And, um, and that's fine. That's good. You know, recycling is great. Keep recycling, by the way. Don't, don't worry about all these silly stories that keep coming across the journalism. But, um, you know, the bins are important. The system's important, but the idea of moving into reuse is really what we're uh, focusing on now. And the team is a, a wide group of us. There's folks from Seattle Public Utilities uh, through our Green Business Program contract. We have Cascadia Consulting in, involved and others as well. And um, our focus is really to start the conversations, uh, connect the dots. Um, there's so much excitement in this room about uh, the different types of reuse and the different ways uh, the circular economy can be advanced. But for us right now, we're focusing on single use packaging. Um, we look forward to uh, you know, the variety of different ways in which the circular economy can be advanced. But uh, at this time, that's our focus. So, and we already have some activation in town. We're excited about that. We have a couple reuse vendors, as we call them, uh, providing services in different ways. Thanks to Bold Reuse today for providing the re reusable containers for the food service. Um, and I just want to, you know, emphasize that, you know, SPU's role through the Green Business Program is just uh, to connect the dots and make sure that everybody involved, everybody interested ha has the opportunity to figure out where they can fit in. Uh, even for those, we were just chatting uh, a few minutes ago during the break, for those who don't actually even, uh, you know, get the funding through today's competition, you know, we're here to support you as well. We are an agency. There are other agencies here as well, of course, from county and state and, and beyond. Um, we have a person visiting Seattle in a couple of weeks from the White House who wants to uh, learn more about Reuse Seattle. So it's really, it's, it's getting momentum and it's getting traction. And um, so we're just happy to be part of it. And thanks for the opportunity to talk about Reuse Seattle. Hi, everybody. Welcome back from lunch. Hope you enjoyed the tacos. I know I did. Um, my name is Lizzie Paul. I'm a consultant with RRS. Um, I'm located in Tacoma, Washington, so it's been really exciting to see all these great Washington-based projects and learning more about them. Um, so thank you to all of the upstream teams for sharing your amazing projects with us. We'll be moving on to seven downstream teams next. Just a reminder, each team will have seven minutes to present their project, followed by a quick five-minute question and answer session from the judges. Um, each team is competing for a $10,000 prize, and then there is the People's Choice Award at the very end. And I realized I failed to introduce myself earlier, so sorry about that. <laughs> I'm, I'm Bryce Hesterman. I'm a senior consultant at RRS, and um, I'm also the, the uh, program manager for, for Next Cycle Washington, and I'm based in Portland. And so, well, thank you. Um, so yeah, I do want to introduce the judges. We have a new panel of judges here. So the upstream judges, they're off the hook, but let's give them a round of applause. So for downstream, we have uh, Robert Duff with Department of Commerce. We have McKenna Morgan with uh, SPU, Seattle Public Utilities. And we have Ben Nahir with Elevate Capital and uh, Banush Najafi with Circular by Design. So uh, we're, we're welcoming them. So thank you for joining us. Here's the lineup. We have Glacier coming out first, followed by Restaurant to Garden, Book Hill Group, Birch Biosciences. So it's the same format as before. We're gonna do four, have a break, and then the final three. And then we're gonna hang out and have a reception and then hear the winners. Um, and so uh, following the break, we'll have uh, GPI and Big Recyclers, Ravel and Duwamish Valley Sustainability Associates. Not here to listen to me. We're here to listen to our teams. And so I'm going to invite Rebecca with Glacier up here to the podium. Um, Glacier's mission is to end waste through developing and deploying AI-enabled industrial robots that automate sorting at recycling facilities. Uh, 
that's going to improve the quality, the quality of outgoing recycled commodities and improve the capture rate. Um, so I want to welcome her to the stage and let her take it away from here. Thank you. Testing, testing, no. Hello, hello. Uh, all right, hi everyone. My name is Rebecca and I'm the founder of Glacier. Uh, as Bryce mentioned, we are building AI and robotics to fundamentally, fundamentally revolutionize the way that our society both tracks and recovers our recyclables. Oops. All right, so my background is actually in management consulting. I was at Bain & Company for several years working in their industrial manufacturing practice. Uh, my co-founder, Areeb, was a software engineering lead at Facebook for many years. And both of us left our previous jobs because we felt like we wanted to put our working hours to a cause that really matters. We're very fortunate to be joined by a team of excellent engineers, data scientists, and business leaders from companies like Google and Amazon and institutions like MIT and Stanford. And all of them are joining us because we are deeply committed to fixing our country's recycling infrastructure. Now, it's probably no surprise to anyone in this room, but there has never been a more urgent time to fix our country's recycling infrastructure. Between now and the year 2030, we need to somehow figure out a way to triple the amount of recyclables we're collecting at near perfect purity rates with half as many workers as we had before COVID. Uh, obviously a very daunting landscape. Uh, one particular macro factor I wanna call out is legislation. Um, many of you in the room have probably heard a lot of the chatter around packaging EPR or extended producer responsibility. And as that comes online in more states like Oregon, California, um, and so on, uh, the question then becomes how on earth are we going to measure what is actually being recycled or not recycled at scale? We've never been able to do that before. And furthermore, how are we going to massively increase our recycling rates beyond what we're already doing? Now enter AI. With advances in artificial intelligence, we can actually make changes to such macro systems in a matter of months that used to take years or even decades. It's no wonder that the market for recycling automation is a $65 billion total addressable market. And Glacier is really proud to be at the vanguard of this cause. We have created an automated sorting robot that is specifically purpose-built for the recycling use case. So here's one of our robots in action at a recycling facility. Uh, this particular robot is working on a line where it's picking PET thermoforms off of a conveyor belt that should be all PET. Um, our AI can currently identify already over 90% of the typical curbside recycling stream, including plastic film, PET, HDPE, aluminum cans, you name it. And then our robot can actually pick up the right items and sort them into the correct location. Uh, we're working with several MRFs across the country already, and they're seeing typically a one to two year payback period, which is stellar for this type of equipment. Now, um, our MRFs love our robot. And frankly, we're not that surprised because MRFs told us what to build in the first place. Before we ever designed our robot, we talked to over 30 different recycling facilities and asked them what they would need to feel really, really excited about buying a robot. And they told us three things over and over again. The first is no downtime. Downtime is insanely expensive and these MRFs make their money on being able to run at full capacity. So we designed a robot that you can install in one day or over the weekend. Secondly, this robot needs to have killer ROI, right? Uh, MRFs want robots that can pay back, pay for their own labor. And so we built a robot at very low cost with extremely high performance. And we're already seeing one to two year payback periods with current pricing and performance. We also offer leasing models that basically mean you're paying monthly for the robot. So it's already delivering more value to you on day one than you're paying out of pocket for it. And then finally, this robot needs to be able to fit anywhere we need it, right? If a robot is awesome, but it's way too big to install in your facility, it doesn't really do you any good. So we built a robot that fits anywhere a person can stand. And the cool thing about fitting anywhere a person can stand is that this robot is also collecting all kinds of interesting information in all kinds of interesting places. Uh, when you look at what these robots are delivering in terms of the AI data value, Recycling facilities love this data because it lets them look at things in real time, like inbound contamination, recovery rate, what they're sending to landfill. 
But what's even cooler is that you can use this data to finally unify the entire circular economy. That same data set can be used by a Fortune 500 brand to understand the impact that their packaging has and what's actually being done to recover it curbside. Uh, an entity like Washington Ecology can also use that same data set to understand their citizens' recycling behavior and actually implement and, com uh, and monitor compliance with smart regulations. Now, we are in the sustainability business, but we also have to grow sustainably as a business. So uh, these are our unit economics, or in other words, our margins. This is at current pricing, both our robot and our AI scanner are both delivering gross margins of over 70%. In other words, we are building a software style business that happens to have a hardware component. We expect those margins to improve even more as we improve our performance over the coming years and lower our own cost to produce our hardware. And so now after three and a half short years, Glacier has built a best in class sorting robot. We have a loyal customer base that loves both the robot and the AI we're giving them. And we also have an amazing pipeline of $11.5 million in near-term projects. Worth noting that over two thirds of that pipeline is coming to us inbound. So it's word of mouth referrals from existing customers and other industry partnerships we've built. Uh, but if you click into that pipeline, we've been really methodical about testing all of these different verticals that we could be selling into and making sure we have a market that's bigger than just one segment of the circular economy. Our robots have sorted over 1,800 tons of materials for MRFs. We're also working with reclaimers, Fortune 500 brands, and governments, including one of the top five largest cities in the US. And we've proven out that what we're building can really unify the entire circular economy, which is really where we're headed. We're currently raising our next round of funding, two to $3 million, to essentially satisfy near-term capital, uh, near-term pipeline, while also building the infrastructure to, to deploy a fleet of dozens of robots in the next year. And of course, that is just one stepping stone on our way to our much larger vision. Ultimately, Glacier seeks to build a world where every single can, every box, every bottle that you throw out can be both tracked and recovered by Glacier's technology. We hope you'll join us on our journey to end waste. Thank you. The, the uh, Rob Duff, uh, Department of Commerce. Thanks. That's really impressive. Uh, enjoyed the presentation. Um, one only one question is: uh, seems like it's a a great uh, ROI here. In the thinking into the future, how many customers do you think you'll ultimately have? Do you, I mean, it's going to be more than MRFs and reclaimers. Is there a future for these robots beyond that immediate and necessary need? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, the short answer is, of course, yes. Um, you know, my co-founder and I started Glacier because we wanted to have an impact on the waste industry specifically. So we're looking near term at other waste related adjacencies, for example, construction and demolition debris, e-waste is top of mind for everyone, composting and organics, etc. There are a lot of applicable use cases for this type of AI enabled sortation. Thanks so much. Um, so the recycling industry has historically been a very market um, aware and market driven industry. And when something is likely to make it money, it tends to um, channel investment into those activities. Um, you seem like you're establishing a foothold in this industry, you're doing well. Um, your best in class technology is, is gaining you customers and market share. Um, what do you need from a like a market development program like this, like where is the the gap? Where is the um, the opportunity that you're hoping to help get support in closing um, through a program like Next Cycle? Yeah, it's a really great question. So Next Cycle has already delivered us a tremendous amount of value in the types of introductions it's been making for us, not only directly to recycling facilities, but also to folks at the government, municipal and state level, right? So understanding where our legislation is headed and where that might drive further need for innovation like ours. Um, on top of that, you know, I would say that 
a lot of recycling facilities invest in innovation when they see a very clear path to increased profitability. So for example, when there is a stronger end market need for certain types of commodities, we suddenly see an influx of customers coming to us to ask for robots and AI. For example, in California, uh, PET thermoform recycling has recently gained a lot of attention. So now we have a lot of folks in our pipeline saying, hey, can your robot uh, actually sort thermoforms? And the answer is yes, it can. Um, and so by creating stronger end markets, um, we really see that upstream pull to innovate more, to deliver more efficiency. But we really need that downstream robustness in order for our robot to really achieve that foothold. A very nice presentation. Uh, you spent pretty much the whole time talking about the hardware, but there's clearly a software component to this. So can you provide a little more detail on the software? And then how are you financing the cost of the hardware since this is a lease to own and you're not getting paid up front? Great question. So on the software side of things, you know, every time I mention AI, sometimes there's confusion in this industry about what that refers to. I'm really referring to purely that software layer, right? So uh, our AI algorithm can identify item by item what's coming down that belt. And then the true magic is somewhat in the computer vision, but more so in what insights you can pull from that data set. I'll give you a very tactical example. One of our Murph customers installed a camera on their landfill line. And so now they can see on a minute by minute basis what items they're losing to the landfill, how much value that equates to, and where they might make upstream investments to improve their overall efficiency. Um, if I had 20 more minutes, I could go through similar use cases for each type of customer segment we're working with. Second question was around, I think, working capital around this lease to own model. Uh, so the way we currently structure our customer agreements is we'll actually take an upfront deposit or a setup fee before we start any design work. And that $50,000 deposit covers our entire cost of goods sold for the robot. So in other words, we're margin positive on day one. We take that money from the customer. We can apply it towards actually fabricating the robot for them. After we install it, that's when the remainder of the lease term begins. Uh, I have one more question. Let's, um, can you talk a little bit more about the IP? since presumably at least part of this is proprietary to you. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we do have a couple of patents pending, but long-term, both my co-founder and I believe that that only provides a sort of limited moat for us, right? So uh, one thing I didn't go into is what makes our particular robot unique. Um, we are entirely purpose-built, which means we've sourced our motors, our arms, our control panel, everything separately, and we have done all of the integration work, which actually, actually means, you know, even if one of our competitors disassembled this, sourced all the same parts, put it together, there's an extremely thick software layer that actually gets this robot working as well as it does. And that's where the vast majority of our development time has been. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Rebecca. Next up, we'll hear from Restaurant to Garden. Um, they are working on a community scale composting model utilizing local restaurant food waste in the Chinatown International District. They transform food waste from your favorite local restaurants into nutritious fertilizer to grow culturally appropriate food and continue the circle of life. Testing. All right. This chayote is an example of nutrient re recycling. It was made from discarded restaurant fish heads turned into compost in just a one block radius. I'm Joyce Lin. I'm with Restaurant to Garden, and we transform restaurant food scraps into compost here in Seattle Chinatown International District, also known as CID. And today, I'm looking for $190,000 to purchase an in-vessel composter to scale up our project. Even though Seattle composts, a third of our garbage is still compostable. And we believe this is because the centralized composting system doesn't really work. And specifically, it doesn't really work in our neighborhood. And the concept of out of sight, out of mind is so pervasive that we have gotten very disconnected with our food and waste systems. So let's take a look at our current system. Our food scraps get picked up 
driven around the city, makes its way to a very remote processing site. And this process adds a lot of carbon footprint contributing to climate change. And so we, unfortunately, we think that one solution does not fit all. But hold on, isn't there a solution here? Can't we recycle nutrients locally in our own neighborhoods? This is why we started Restaurant to Garden. We're an all women of color team with a diverse mix of professional and educational experiences. And we are from the CID community. We share the cultural and linguistic backgrounds with the people we serve. and it decided to freeze. Okay. Our, we envision a future where local food scraps turn into local compost, turn into locally grown, culturally appropriate produce. We piloted this idea in the Danny Wu Community Garden, the only green space in the CID. Also, this neighborhood has suffered um, from environmental racism. We started composting about a year ago and we source our food scraps from Itsumoto and historic Panama Hotel Tea House. So far, we have composted 4,000 pounds of food scraps um, through the hot composting method. And we have given out 3,500 pounds of compost to elder Asian American gardeners. So just within a year, we composted a lot. This is equivalent to the weight of a car and we avoided 12 metric tons of carbon dioxide. Our project also brings immense social benefits like hiring local youth and revitalizing an unsafe part of the garden. And we were able to attract all these generous support from funders, and you may recognize some of them. And since our project started, we were able to fundraise $193,000. So now let's talk about opportunities. Washington has an aggressive goal of diverting 75% of organic material from the landfill seven years from now. This is a major opportunity for us. And what we are demonstrating here is a model that is replicable and scalable. And so to better understand how we can expand, we are launching our preliminary market research thanks to Renew uh, Renew Seed Grant with Next Cycle, and we're doing this alongside our pilot project. And so we um, interviewed a lot of businesses in the CID neighborhood. And if you're all visiting, please come visit the neighborhood this weekend. It's a food lovers hub, and you do not want to miss out because we offer 110 businesses just within a square mile. And um, four businesses are ready to jump on and work with us as soon as we have the equipment ready to go. And just look at these positive responses. Aren't they incredible? We also um, surveyed our next um, target audience, which is compost users. So they are landscapers and local gardeners. And they also had really good things to say too. The majority want to try our product. Um, and my favorite memory and story to tell um, when I composted in uh, the CID is gardeners swarm to our site to pick up compost whenever they're ready. So this tells us that they really love our product. That means in order to meet this demand, we must expand. So now we um, partner up with Chinese Southern Baptist Church and Washington State Department of Transportation to revitalize this unbuildable lot. We, we want to revitalize it into the CID environmental hub so that we can realize our vision of hyperlocal composting. At the heart of this is this in-vessel composter, which allows us to revolutionize organics management at a very local, at a very local level. And so with this new equipment, we are able to scale up our operations by 30 times to compost 92 tons of food scraps a year to generate over 160,000 cubic yards of compost. And we propose four income streams, compost sales, tipping fees, workshops and tours, and finally consulting services to groups who want to replicate our model.
In terms of financials, our annual projected income is $580,000, um, where compo sales take up the largest income stream at um, 85%. And this is uh, assuming that we're operating at full capacity without any grant funding. And so this means that we will be financially sufficient. In terms of startup costs for the CID hub, we are totaling um, the cost to be $480,000. And we have secured funding and have pending applications in three of the four expense categories. So today, we are asking for $190,000 to help, help purchase this in-vessel composter to do local composting. We are currently fundraising for C Capital so that we can break ground um, by early 2024 uh, to install the composter and then run at full capacity by 2025. And with that, I do need to stop now. <laughs> um, and I'm gonna invite my whole team on stage for a Q&A. Thank you. I guess I'll start with questions since I have the microphone. <laughs> um, great project. Really enjoyed listening to your presentation. Um, just curious to know, can you say a little bit more about um, what you think is the value of this particular offering in, in terms of the compost that you're offering um, over and above uh, the centralized model that you presented uh, from the outset from the point of view of the customer. You said a little bit about it, but I'd like to hear more about that. I, I think I would want you to come take a look at our product here. Um, I'm proudly to say that our we offer a much cleaner product. Um, this is because we have a pretty rigorous sorting stream. So we do um, the legwork up front. We also have a really tight relationship with our partner restaurants to give us a, a very clean um, feedstock to start with. Yeah, and just to go off of that, um, some of the problems that we have with centralized compost is just finding um, garbage in the, in the compost as it as it sort of breaks down. And this is a problem in the landscaping industry, which I'm a part of. And so we're we're really um, showing that with this hyper local product, we're able to sort of sort in ways that a centralized system can't and really make it um, like clean and, and well screened. You mentioned that uh, gardeners will swarm to you when compost is ready, but how do they find out about you at all? And especially thinking about this, not in CID, but as you expand into other neighborhoods in Seattle, how do you really get your name out there so that the neighborhood gets to make the maximum use of what you're offering? That is a really great question. Um, where we're working right now in the Danny Wu Community Garden, um, a lot of the gardeners that um, have plots in the garden, uh, they actually live nearby and there is a uh, elder housing facility that is actually overlooking our spot so they can actually physically look out their window and see us. On top of that, we also have um, a pretty great network of word of mouth, like the gardeners see that like somebody's getting compost, I want to get compost too, so they'll come <laughs> find us. But outside of that, seeing um, our CID community is very tight knit. Everybody talks to each other and the word of mouth is very, very strong. And uh, not only to people in the community, but the people who visit it and beyond. And I think right now we're really focused on um, replicating our hyper local model so that when other groups do this, they do it in a very place based and culturally appropriate way for them. Um, so that it's it's sort of we can provide our services to help tailor it to that community, because obviously what the work we're doing in the CID is where we know people we've known them for years and so we don't really have to do much to get our, the word out. Thanks for the presentation. I love the community-based focus here. And my question is about the compost. Do you think you're going to have to expand beyond the community or will you have enough customers? And will you actually stimulate more customers, as you say, that get people excited about using this compost? Or do you think you're going to have to sort of expand beyond the community to, to sell your product? 
I think so. Based on our survey that um, everybody wants to try our product, at one point we would have to expand beyond, um, beyond the CID. So, yeah. Yeah, and I think that's part of the um, market research that we're doing now with Next Cycle is um, just sort of seeing what the customer wants and how we could best distribute it. I'm wondering if you can talk at all about the um, customer engagement. I know you talked a little bit about the challenges of commercial composting, um, and it is sometimes labor intensive um, or challenging to get restaurants to participate correctly. Um, how do you uh, engage in a in a way that's different that makes it more possible for them to participate? Really wonderful question. Um, our um, backgrounds together as a team, we have a mix of um, professional and educational backgrounds, but also our cultural backgrounds are very similar to a lot of the businesses in the CID that we could potentially serve. And because of that, we also... Um, and we also have relationships with the restaurants themselves, so they know some of them know us, and we have a, an opportunity to talk to their back of house, which is where all of these food scraps come from. And we can speak to them in a culturally appropriate way, in a language that they understand. And if we don't have those resources, we are able to um, reach out to people who can help us with that process. Thank you. Right, next we have Book Hill Group. Um, so Ali, why don't you come on down? Book Hill is developing a circular consumer durable product line for organizing and protecting laundry, textiles, and wardrobes. By utilizing recycled inputs and designing for recycling, recyclability, the venture creates a closed loop system for an industry that's larger than you might think. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ali Kanji. I lead Book Hill, a Seattle-based company that manages business interests in commercial laundry, facility services, hygiene, and related industries in different parts of the world. Our next cycle project has evolved out of this work. We're using recycled content to design products that people use to organize their laundry and to protect different types of wardrobe and home textiles. We all share the responsibility of doing our laundry and these products are helpful during the washing cycle as well as the intervening period between washing cycles. They can be used to protect high value apparel, often for garments that are seasonal or that are irregularly sized. At a retailer, you might receive a high value apparel purchase in a branded protective, protective cover. And people often use these products to store clean items like home textiles between uses. The laundry storage and accessories category is low involvement. At the low end of price and quality, it's highly commoditized. As you move up and your threshold for willingness to pay increases, you can generally find better designed options at specialty retailers that focus on high value apparel and home furnishings. We believe there is a compelling blue ocean opportunity to build a category leader and an enduring brand in this part of the spectrum. Unfortunately, the majority of category sales are transacted at the low end from products constructed largely from virgin plastic and derivative materials. Because they're not designed for reusability, when they break, customers throw them out. They end up going to the landfill and accumulating in various ecosystems. We're aiming for a closed loop model. We're starting with recycled content, designing consumer durables, and thinking about how all of the components can be reintegrated into the technical cycle at the end of useful life, or reintegrated into the biological cycle. And there is some variation to this depending on the region of the world where users reside. When we started on this path, 
we wanted to understand designing for specific users and use cases. And in order to do this, we spend a lot of time with and in the environments of potential household customers and people who use these products professionally at work. For example, fashion designers, people who manage wardrobe for film and television productions, hotel managers. We wanted to hone in on why will someone pay a premium for any product within the category? At a high level, the feedback we, we received has coalesced in these three areas. First, customers wanted us to apply specific treatments that are effective in extending the useful life of textiles. Second, they wanted us to do a lot of work on designing for longevity and addressing the dimensions that I've listed here. And finally, people wanted to do things like color match a garment that they buy with the, the color of the protective cover, to be able to put identification tags and RFID tags onto the items to, to be able to move them, for example, to and from a fashion show. And they wanted to use them in a lot of different size and format variations, ultimately to use them systematically or in an organizational system. We've taken all that feedback and these are the five areas where we're planning to innovate. We're aiming for a fairly high eco-effectiveness standard, cradle to cradle. We're going to communicate end of life recycling information using circularity ID. And we're gonna manufacture in a way uh, where it's very clear the equity and social justice objectives that we're going to achieve. Recycling markets uh, require demand pull to function effectively. And we're going to stimulate demand for a wide range of recycled content, as well as companies that are engaged in upstream recycling. Here are a few examples of recycled materials that we're using to create textile storage containers, as well as tagging solutions. Foundationally, we're building complements for very large consumer and apparel markets. And we're confident that we can scale the business at EBITDA margins of 30 to 40%. We estimate the serviceable available market to be roughly 15% of the US population and comparably sized in other attractive markets around the world. Over the next two years, our goal is to build a composable direct-to-consumer commerce approach, as well as consultative uh, work with enterprise clients to scale to 200,000 units manufactured and sold uh, by the end of year two. At that point, over the next five years, we're targeting a venture scale growth curve approximately 50% annual growth per year. And by the end of year seven, uh, we should be approximately this, the size of a, mid, uh, a mid-sized small cap company that is well positioned to facilitate a liquidity event and also has the working capital flexibility to invest in advanced manufacturing. As we think about building the cap table for this new company, uh, I believe that it offers excellent alignment thematically for investors that are focused on consumer, on fashion, and on retail. We're also trying to build best-in-class solutions for the category without compromising on circular economy principles. And to that end, uh, I think we offer great alignment for investors seeking to advance the circular economy, to make an impact on climate-related goals, uh, and on preserving and promoting ocean health. Lastly, through the Next Cycle program, I've tried to challenge myself to purposely organize economic activity in different parts of Washington state. Impact Washington has been very helpful in pointing us in the direction of companies that can help with research and development, with technical design, and with other facets of our supply chain. Similarly, uh, I look forward to building a partnership with the University of Washington uh, and being able to work with students and graduates from the human centered design and engineering programs on shaping our product development and extending human centered design work as we think about how to adapt to fit consumer behavior in other attractive countries around the world. Thank you very much and I welcome any questions that you may have. Thanks Ali, great presentation. Uh you, you presented some uh, possible metrics there on extending the life of, of garments. 
is there do you have any uh, more specifics about that like how long might these might these garments extend versus like what people do now and then does it actually reduce the amount that's going through the washer and into wastewater any metrics to getting back the environmental impact of this idea like great so when we think about laundry storage and accessories, the category covers a lot of different uh, products. As I mentioned, some are used to organize materials, clothing, other home textiles in the intervening period between washing cycles. And there are others that are used to protect delicates. So to answer your question, I, I'll draw your attention to the products used during the washing cycle, mesh bags of different sizes. And I've actually got one here. I'll show Something like, like, like this uh, can be fairly helpful in protecting different, different things uh, that are high value or that require a mesh bag in the washing cycle. Washable footwear, uh, delicates, uh, folks with physical disabilities will often use a bag like this because they're not able to reach the right at the back of a washing machine or a dryer where socks might get stuck. Uh, and so these bags are quite helpful in re reducing microplastics, escaping into the water stream, uh, but also in, especially with the higher value garments or things that are delicate to preserve their, their, their useful life. Thanks for your presentation, Ali. I was just wondering, you mentioned that there are several products that can be made from um, um, recycling. And I'm just wondering um, which ones you're um, planning on producing. Um, do you have focused products in mind? Okay. These, so uh, mesh bags and garment covers and solid bags, is that where you're starting from? Yeah, th thanks a lot for your question. I'll provide a bit more detail on this. Um, when we think about doing laundry well or what anyone might need in their home when they're going to try to tackle this during the washing cycle and in the intervening period, mesh bags come in different shapes, small, medium sized, large. They can be used for a single pair of shoes all the way up to a couple of garments, or as I mentioned, an entire load of laundry. Uh, parents with uh, young children often like to put socks together and a lot of small laundry. So those are the, the types of products um, that might fit for mesh bags. Garment covers are used within, within the wardrobe and professionally they can be used to move large amounts of, for example, a fashion designer might move lots of a, a large amount of garments to and from a fashion house or to and from a fashion show. A hotel might use solid bags to orchestrate a guest laundry program. And for the folks who transport laundry in and out of the home, they ultimately will likely opt for solid bags rather than bins or, or hampers. Uh, on a textile storage basis, these are generally designed for uh, bedding, tablecloths, under covers, and things that often have a home or should have a home in the rooms where they're going to be used next. If you think about somebody who has a five bedroom house, uh, perhaps two or three bedrooms are used regularly and two bedrooms are for guests. Uh, storing uh, clean but not currently being used home textiles in the room where they're going to be used next is a use case that when you talk to people who have second homes or very large spaces, uh, they find that that presents a lot better organization as opposed to stuffing things in closets or commingling in a particular lo location. And finally, tagging solutions. You know, this is sort of designed to work as a system and to fit the needs of different commercial and household users. Tagging solutions simply enable someone to identify, put their name or, or a brand uh, onto a tag, and then for that item to move in and out of a workplace or in a commercial setting to, to move large amounts of items together, they can uh, have RFID tags. Uh, but ultimately, the idea is that you uh, are facilitating a wide range of use cases by designing tagging solutions that can be self-customized or that uh, brands can ultimately customize uh, for a specific workflow. So I know we have just uh, about a minute left, so I'll keep this short. Um, your unit uh, your unit sales, you said 200,000, 25 million, that's a $125 price point. Yep. I'm struggling a little bit with who your customer is because you go back and forth between talking about consumer, hotels or enterprises, and then fashion shows, which all have very different price points and use cases. So can you just tell us a little bit more about who specifically you want to go, you want to try and sell to first. Sure. So within the, the household segment, the target user is a laundry doer, someone who can derive value from lots of different products across these product areas. The price point is largely focused on capturing willingness to pay uh, in, in the point of the spectrum where we're, we're trying to 
position. And the example I'll give is if you're uh, spending two or three thousand dollars on a dress, or if you're, you can think about it in terms of a wedding gown, that on a commensurate basis, spending one or two hundred dollars on a protective cover, much like you would protect a higher value laptop, is uh, is appropriate. And so by focusing on um, the, that serviceable available market, that's about 15% of the population that uh, prefers or that is willing to pay a premium for some of the benefits that I listed, that ultimately we'll be able to, uh, $125 is an average price point across the product lines, uh, but largely range, it'll, it'll range from about $80 to up to two or three, $300. That's the way that we think about it. And from an enterprise basis, some of those customers might be renting product as a service, but that's more or less how, how it's uh, priced. Next up, we have Birch Biosciences. Birch Biosciences is engineering a bioenzymatic process to break down and recycle PET plastic. The process produces clean virgin equivalent recycled PET inputs that can meet recycled content packaging goals without sacrificing quality. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So. Today, globally, we consume more than $500 billion worth of plastic a year, right? You can just look around um, here or at your home, uh, right? There are plastic products all around us. In the United States, we consume more plastic per capita than anyone, and we recycle less than 10% of this material each year. The unfortunate side is we, this number hasn't improved over the past decade in spite of all of our best efforts, right? We need new ideas, real innovation in the plastic and plastic recycling space to bring plastics into the circular economy. At Birch, we think about plastic recycling very differently. We engineer enzymes that act as molecular scissors that effectively chop up plastic into the building blocks that were used to manufacture that plastic in the first place. Birch is led by myself, Emily, and Lewis. I have more than 10 years of experience working uh, in synthetic biology at leading biotechnology companies. Emily is an expert biochemist and operations leader, and Lewis is an expert uh, data scientist and computational biologist. And we three are leading Birch day to day. The problem that we're really trying to solve for is mechanical recycling. Today, 98% of plastics are recycled using heat. So plastic is sorted and then melted that molten plastic is then extruded into pellets, these recycled pl plastic pellets that are used to manufacture the next generation product. The problem is that heat damages plastic. It reduces the quality, um, the color, the melting properties, the clarity of that plastic. It's an inferior product. Importantly, mechanical recycling uses a lot of heat, a lot of energy input. Uh, this produces a lot of CO2 and other greenhouse gas emissions. And finally, uh, more often than not, when a beverage container is recycled, it actually gets turned into a textile that never gets recycled. This is a linear recycling system, not a circular system. We've spent a lot of time thinking about how do we reinvent plastic recycling? And we're really excited about enzymes because we think they can truly address efficiency, economics, and circularity of plastic recycling. So we're focused on PET plastics to start. Um, and the way enzymes work is, is sort of as I described to break down the, these materials into their uh, building blocks, but they do so at low temperature. Um, that's really important that the, the, uh, the amount of utility inputs into the process are significantly reduced. Uh, we anticipate that we'll reduce CO2 and greenhouse gas emissions associated with plastic recycling by 70%. And importantly, because we do this work at low temperature, we're not damaging the material. So it enables infinite plastic recycling where we can go from beverage container to beverage container to beverage container again and again. So how do we do this? Conceptually, it's quite simple. We go to plastic contaminated environments and uh, scrape microbes that are, gr are growing um, on these plastics in the environment. We bring them into the lab and isolate the enzymes that are producing the circular molecules that we're interested in. We then engineer these enzymes to perform under industrially scalable plastic recycling conditions. We've thought a lot about our process end to end, and it's important to note that we don't need to reinvent the entire plastic recycling process. 
Uh, the petrochemical industry has current art on how to uh, recover and purify the petrochemicals that we're working with. So the technical risk in our work is really in the enzymes and answering this question, are our enzymes able to digest most plastics most of the time? So Birch is about two years old. Uh, we really got our start uh, uh, in early 2022 uh, with SBIR grant funding. Uh, very quickly thereafter, we participated in the Y Combinator Business Accelerator and raised a small seed round um, after that. Uh, to date, we're really trying to move from science project to business. And the way that we do that is to demonstrate that our technology works at a pilot plant scale. So we're actively designing a pilot plant where we can take commercial bales of plastic, um, grind that material up and demonstrate sort of the yield and sort of techno-economics of our process. Um, the plan is then by mid-2024 uh, to take that data package, go out and raise a Series A and build our first commercially scalable uh, plastic recycling plant. Our business model is to be vertically integrated. We intend to build small footprint, low emission recycling facilities near major metropolitan areas where, we'll re where, we'll, where we will source PET plastics, break that material down, and then partner with major PET manufacturers and plastic packaging companies um, to take our 100% virgin quality PET material. Uh, it's important to note that we have more than $80 million in LOIs to date from major plastic packaging and manufacturing companies that just demonstrates the unmet need for high quality circular plastic materials. So plastic recycling is an old business, right? It's been around for decades. There's been a lot of CapEx that's been spent on mechanical recycling and the supply relationships to feed those plants. Uh, the industry has not been sitting still. They've been trying to reinvent plastic recycling. Uh, uh, chemical recycling ha has sort of come around in the last 10 years, but uh, there's a lot of debate about chemical recycling. And I would argue that chemical recycling doesn't address the sustainability and circularity of plastics and doesn't really solve the problem. It creates a real opportunity for companies like Birch that can really function in this sort of transformational space to truly reinvent plastic recycling and bring plastics into the circular economy. So to date, we've raised about $4.7 million in government grants and VC funding, gives us about 32 months of runway um, at our current burn. Uh, we're actively raising uh, a half a million dollars to support uh, build out of our pilot plant. Uh, this is really sort of an important demonstration for us uh, to be able to demonstrate to ourselves, uh, to our investors, and to sort of all of you that are um, that the economics, that the sustainability, that that sort of the metrics pencil out for this new process. So finally, I've, I've talked about PET plastics today, but I just want to point out that this is the tip of the iceberg. There's no reason that we can't design enzymes for additional classes of plastic um, to sort of uh, follow on from our PET work. So. I'm a real believer that enzymes will drive the circularity and sustainability of plastics moving forward. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks for that um, presentation. I, I'm wondering, you mentioned uh, just at the end there that you are focusing first on on PET, but potentially could apply elsewhere. But I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about your anticipated feedstocks just within the PET space. Is this um, technology, how much confidence do you have that it'll be um, applicable to um, different forms of PET? Or are you really focused on um, PET beverage containers, or would it be applicable to other types of PET as well? Yeah, so the, the beauty of the technology is that um, it's sort of agnostic. So like thermoformed uh, uh, PET, like plastic clamshells are, are a perfect substrate. We can also recycle polyester textiles um, using, using this technology. And so it is agnostic. So um, you know, one of the benefits of the system is that we don't need perfect sortation, right? Um, you know, there's a lot of work that's gone into sort of sorting bottles, for example, uh, um, you know, for, for mechanical recycling, but we can take sort of what's left or the undervalued or kind of um, the, the plastics that aren't get, getting recycled today and demonstrate that we can uh, recover and, and sort of uh, produce high quality plastics from, from those materials that really aren't effectively recycled anywhere across the country today. Love the use of uh, biochemistry here meets plastics. Um, 
my question is about, it seems like you have really good expertise and uniquely started selecting those microbes and enzymes by getting soccer balls that had stuff growing on them. I love that. Um, so my question is the engineering to scale up, right? When you, you, we know that the microbes need to have nice medium to grow in, right? Scaling that up's a little bit different than, you know, growing them in a, you know, a flask. So do you, have you put any thought into, are you going to run into any hurdles as you try to scale these things up to a, like giant reactor vessels? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, yeah, an important clarification is that we will not be using live microbes in the, in our enzymatic digestion. So I call it laundry detergent grade uh, enzymes, right? So we will uh, sort of in a separate kind of manufacturing process produce uh, low cost enzymes that'll cost about 20 to $25 a kilogram is sort of like the standard uh, pricing for that material. Um, but then we'll take, you know, basically bags of, of uh, freeze dried enzymes and sort of be able to dump that into a tank with our ground up plastics. And that creates a much more uniform scalable process than one that uh, is dependent on live microbes. Um, I was wondering how much the cost of this, um, like, say, a PET bottle, how much the cost is relative to virgin plastic. And related to that, um, do you have target customers in mind um, for your initial offer? Yeah. So, um, so right now, so we have a, a techno-economic model that we're working on with uh, the National Renewable Energy Lab in Colorado. So they've they've done a lot of sort of LCA and, and related analyses on this process. Um, and so we can compete on price with mechanically recycled plastic today, um, you know, basically because we uh, we have a lower cost input. In input. Uh, you know, we're not we don't have a high utility bill. Uh, we don't need perfectly sorted plastic. And, uh, you know, there's some yield assumptions based on that on that for sure. Um, and then in terms of customers. Uh, so um, I'm trying to think a lot of what, what I can say, because there's some confidentiality confidentiality associated with this. There are like the world's largest uh, plastic manufacturers and the world's largest plastic packaging brands um, are unable to meet their sustainability requirements, right? For 2025 or 2030, they don't know where the high value plastic is coming from. They're sort of scrambling, uh, right? And so there's a major unmet need for this in the marketplace. So like there are major consumer brands and sort of the suppliers of those major brands that we've talked to that we have uh, you know, more the, the more than $80 million in letters of intent really come from, from them uh, because, you know, from consumers, from, from governments, if you think of the state of Washington, right, this, you know, the need to have 50% recycled content um, and sort of food contact applications by 2030, like we're going to be, we, we intend to be the supplier of that high quality recycled material. So you mentioned enzyme design a few times and yet you're scraping soccer balls and other things. So can you tell us a little bit about the IP, a little bit about what you're doing to create maybe more efficient enzymes and why other companies that are looking at chemical recycling haven't been able to do this? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So to be clear, this idea is not new, right? People have been publishing papers and you might read about them in the New York Times or the Guardian, right? Where somebody will say like, I found an enzyme, it eats plastic. We're going to save the world, right? And um, it gives people hope and that's great. Um, uh, but um, those enzymes have never been commercialized. Right. And so we live in this moment today where we have sort of unprecedented uh, technology. Um, AI is, is a big part of this, right? The ability to basically model an enzyme. And you can think of an enzyme like a Pac Man that has to dock with a hydrophobic substrate. And so we have an oil and water problem. And so we're at this point in time today with, with the, the technology and sort of machine learning uh, capabilities that we can actually figure out how to do that and truly reinvent or sort of evolve these enzymes to properly dock and sort of cut these plastics in an efficient fashion, which uh, is really unprecedented. It's something you couldn't do five years ago. Thank you. Uh, our next team, which is a collaboration, this really shows a great example of partnership that happened through this program. So the Glass Packaging Institute and Beverage Industry Glass Recyclers, or Big Recyclers. Um, they're teaming up to develop an aggregation hub for glass recycling in central Washington for source separated glass containers, specifically at the beginning generated by the wine industry. Uh, by creating a regional hub and spoke system, significant volumes of glass can be diverted to recycling markets west of the Cascades in an economical way. Scott and Chris, come on up. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Chris Luke. I'm the founder of Big Recyclers. 
focusing on beverage industry glass in the Walla Walla and Tri-Cities area. Of the 600 craft beverage producers that call Eastern Washington home, fully 50% of those are located in the Tri-Cities and Walla Walla areas. And I'm talking wineries, cideries, distilleries. A lot of those beverages are consumed locally at tasting rooms and all of those empty bottles go right into area landfills. 2019, a small group of us, uh, concerned citizens and winery producers began tackling the growing glass waste stream in the Walla Walla Valley. I worked with 25 wineries to collect every week one ton of glass from them, ground it into a material called glass sand, and then tried to move that uh, byproduct every week. And though that provided us with a very small, um, hyper-locally way of diverting one ton of glass into our landfill every week, it was nothing compared to the five and six tons of winery glass that's produced every week during the tourist season. And so we closed down our um, operation late last year and went in search of a big long-term solution. And that solution came through Next Cycles Accelerator Workshop Program, where we began to collaborate with GPI, the Glass Packaging Institute, which is the nation's largest glass manufacturing trade association. And so without further ado, I would like to introduce our partner and president of GPI, Scott DeFife. Thank you very much, Chris. And we were also very happy to be introduced to Big Recyclers and Chris and his team in Eastern Washington, because the concept that we had come in with was to create an aggregation hub, but we were still going to need local partners to collect the glass. Essentially what we're doing in this project, in this collaboration together, is joining up a new separate stream of glass collection programs locally with an aggregation hub in central Washington where the industry can help bring the economies of scale to move the glass to the West Coast and markets. At the same time that Chris and his team were looking for local solutions, we were studying larger national gaps in the glass recycling supply chain all across the country. There are significant gaps that keep us from getting glass from where it is to where it needs to be back into the glass recycling system. In particular, the problem in Eastern Washington is tailor-made for the hub and spoke system that we're putting together. There is a large concentration of glass users, commercial glass, in addition to residential, but we're starting with commercial because that is a largely unregulated system that doesn't, that has non-commingled, less contaminated material. And nearly 25% of the glass nationally is in some of your favorite beverages, alcoholic beverages, beer, wine, spirits of that nature. And then also food is 25%. But if we can collect the glass separately from commercial venues and move it, we can avoid the contamination that befalls the, a lot of the residential glass. And so by putting those things together, and uh, solving the problem of the distance to markets. So currently each individual county or city has got to move their glass by themselves the 200 or so miles from Eastern or Central Washington to the end markets in Seattle or Portland. If we as the industry create the hub, then we can use efficiencies and move to eventually rail transportation that will move the material more efficiently and environmentally uh, in better manner to end markets in Seattle and Portland. In addition, we are going to benefit the state of Washington by avoiding the nearly 90,000 tons of glass that the Department of Ecology estimated is going into Washington landfills every year. The solution here is the hub and spoke model. So this map is the map that overlays the Washington state area, AVAs, the wine industry, AVAs, with the end markets processing and glass manufacturing plants on the West Coast. Putting our hub and spoke in a decidedly low tech manner, that's our graphic, <laughs> uh, in the Tri-Cities area will allow the communities and the wineries in Eastern and Central Washington to move their glass 20 to 30 to 40 miles instead of 200 miles each, where then the industry will work to get the, to take the bulk of the, of the transportation miles to market. The hub and spoke model is scalable. It allows us to start spokes and then scale up with more spokes. And then in addition, we have a low cost barrier of entry hub that we've identified this, this past week with a local hauler in the Tri-Cities area. 
that allows us to get started sooner, but we've also identified a growth area where we can locate our own uh, property on rail access and barge access for the future <laughs> um, that we can grow into. In addition, if the, if the hub and spoke in Eastern Washington works, then we can establish another one in the Central Washington area. So late this uh, year or last year, we sent out a questionnaire to 140 wineries in Walla Walla, as well as another 40 hospitality uh, businesses in the Valley. And fully 90% of those responses that we got back totally support this hub and spoke idea, as well as paying into a, a nominal uh, co-op membership to off help offset the cost of the spokes that we set up. And a quick growth model um, early on with just one hub and two spokes, Walla Walla and Benton City, where we were meeting with wineries this past week, we can get started with a, a small collection model that we can then scale up over time to add spokes and then add participants in each spoke. Going forward, uh, our costs of course increase as the more we are getting, but it becomes more efficient because this is really applies the economies of scale. So the more glass we get, the more per, per ton cost goes lower to move it over to the West Coast. The next steps that we've been articulating are site selection, determination, working with local governments to get the word out, working with the wine industry to get participants, and, and finalizing the business model between the cooperative business ventures that will be coming together. And that is our presentation. Um, I will add that with we can do this without any additional funding, but with $50,000, we can immediately start collecting glass within the next 45 to 90 days and double the amount of spokes that we can do with an additional $150,000, we can start to scale up the separate site and prepare the rail transportation. So you talked a lot about the end users, the, the wineries. Um, what kind of feedback or buy-in are you getting from the brands that are like the big brands that are producing uh, a lot of the glass bottles. Have you, go ahead. Well, so Scott, because he's head of GPI, already today has talked with Arta Glass in Seattle and OI owns Illinois Kalama in Kalama, Washington, both of which produce uh, huge amounts of wine bottles. Um, they are super excited about our project because it's going to give them a really clean um, source of feedstock which, is, you know, they're getting a lot of their glass from the curbside recycling um, projects going on along the I-5 corridor. Fully 40% of that is so contaminated that it goes right into a landfill. So they are clamoring for clean, super clean feedstock. And if Eastern Washington can, can produce that, we're going to give it to them. The medium-sized wineries and the smaller wineries are very excited about this. We met with many of them that are ready to get going tomorrow. Um, we have not yet talked to the larger wineries, but through marketing representatives and things of that nature that we know with like Kendall Jackson and Chateau St. Michel, that they have much larger volumes and really no place to take that glass either. Once we create the facility, we think that the scale can, can increase exponentially if we get the engagement of the large ones. I find that hub and spoke model of collection really interesting. Um, wondering if you could talk a little bit about the challenges that you've experienced in implementing, and also if you have any thoughts um, around whether this model could be applicable for other material. Um, yeah, other materials. To address the hurdles that we've run into. So we started this in 2019, and I think that was the biggest eye opener for me was just how many hurdles there were or just how many agencies and the lack of sort of conversation and collaboration that was going behind it. Uh, glass is inherently inert, non-environmentally toxic. So why are you talking to me about glass? Let's talk about plastic. Let's talk about motor oil going into my landfill. Um, and the other thing was, um, like Scott said, wineries and beverage industry want to recycle their glass. They know that extended um, packaging uh, legislation is coming through. It's not if, but when. So if we can get ahead of this, 
uh, before it ever passes, then we're ahead of the game. We already have a working model. As far as other materials go, um, of course, we're the glass industry, so we want, we're concerned about the glass, uh, glass recycling. Um, but glass lends itself to this in particular because glass has been around for ages, centuries even. It was one of the, the original OG, if you will, of beverage packaging to a certain extent. But the single stream, and I don't mean, mean to knock single stream glass collecting because it has its role, but it has, it's not good for glass. And it largely is leaving glass behind. The reason that communities, especially east of the Cascades, are not able to recycle their glass is not because of the glass, although the weight matters, but really to the transportation. It's because of the, the intricacies of the global commodity market that are impacting the overall blended rate of recyclables. The glass is a steady municipal bond, while the other things are the stocks that go up and down. Thanks so much. It's so exciting to see you. Um, uh, your two organizations coming together and, and collaborating on this. Um, I know as we've gone through the next cycle um, accelerator program, um, that something that I hoped as um, a participant early on that this um, would happen. And it's so nice to see organically um, two ideas coming together and finding a way to collaborate um, and achieve you know, both of your goals and, and then some. Uh, my question is, uh, as someone who works in the sort of recycling industry, I do often hear folks question the value of recycling glass or the collecting glass from so far afield and um, the transportation impacts of transporting it so far. I'm wondering if you could talk, if you've done any um, studies or have any information about like, how do we know that this is really going to be delivering an environmental benefit for Washington? Absolutely. Um, we've got numerous studies in the past that have shown us that moving the glass within an economic range of two, you know, 150 to 200 miles easily benefits any of the expenses that are necessary or the environmental uh, cost of transporting the material to, to the end market. That's usually with contaminated glass. With clean streams of glass, that, that can be further, right? In addition, using the glass into making new glass. Glass is in, infinitely recyclable. Once we've converted the raw materials into glass once, it's glass forever. You're offsetting, every ton offsets 1.1 tons of raw materials and allows the furnace applications to turn down the temperature of the furnace to lower emissions and carbon footprint at the glass plants. It's because remelting glass takes less energy than converting the raw, to, raw materials into glass in the first place. So another thing is with with if we're going to start aggregating four to five hundred tons of glass in the hub that we have identified in Pasco, um, economies of scale will bring the transportation costs down. Thank you very much. Thank you, Scott and Chris. Next up, we have Duwamish Valley Sustainability Association um, to help combat the ever-growing amount of food waste in the South Park neighborhood and demonstrate feasibility of community-scale food waste recovery using small-scale anaerobic digestion technology. The Duwamish Valley Sustainability Association is developing a project to install and operate a biodigester at one of the largest food rescue operations in the state while enabling local utilization of the biogas and liquid soil amendment produced in the process to benefit the community and local growers and gardeners. Hello, testing. Hello everyone, I'm Cesar Lopez, a senior here at the University of Washington studying environmental science. I'm also a project coordinator at the Duwamish Valley Sustainability Association um, for the biodigester bio project that you will learn about today. Where I work towards a more sustainable and equitable community. And thank you for having me today. So let me tell you a little bit about the Duwamish Valley Sustainability Association. Our community organization provides opportunities for young people from BIPOC uh, families to be trained in STEAM topics 
to develop community programs and projects where needed that will grow healthier, more sustainable communities and help to jumpstart their professional careers. So some of you might be wondering, what is a biodigester? And I encourage you to think about it as a machine that processes food waste into byproducts such as uh, liquid plant food and energy. It's sort of like a natural process, similar to a cow's stomach. So show of hands, who here has no idea where this is? Okay. It's a South Park for those of you that live in Seattle. Why is South Park important? Well, to begin with, most of its res residents have faced historically polluting industries and with that particulate matter and diesel exhaust. Um, they're also near the Duwamish River Superfund site. And with that comes linked health, health issues such as respiratory problems, heart disease, and other health issues linked to that pollution exposure. But South Park, is also a host to local urban farms that operate to serve the community. Now, there has been a disproportionate impact on low-income families who happen to be the majority of residents in South Park, as well as immigrants and people of color. So I'd like to focus on the food system aspect of this problem that has no silver bullet solution. So let's focus. For those of you that haven't heard about Food Lifeline, um, Think about it as a huge food bank and they have um, a place in South Park that will be the host of our biodigester. So we start right there, um, which enable us, enables us to produce probiotic plant food. This plant food will be distributed to local urban farms um, who will use it to grow fresh produce for the community. Our goal is to address the food desert issue in South Park by providing access to healthy, fresh food. We are committed to a circular economy approach where the community will return food waste to us, completing the loop of sustainability. By adopting this approach, we can reduce waste and create a more sustainable future for South Park. So let's talk about the probiotic plant food. This is a sustainable solution uh, for plant nutrition that we plan to produce in the future. With an exceptional blend of organic matter, slow release nutrients, and beneficial microbes, our product enriches the soil and nourishes plants, promoting a thriving eco ecosystem of plants, microbes, and fungi. The sale of PPF will enable the biodigester project to be self-sufficient in time. So what's the market opportunity? First, PPF represents a market opportunity for local urban farms due to the growing interest in urban farming and sustainable agriculture. Urban farms often rely on small spaces that can quickly become depleted of nutrients, making PPF an ideal solution to promote so soil health and plant growth. The unique blend makes it an excellent alternative to traditional fertilizers and synthetic plant foods, which can be harmful to the environment and human health. PPF's sustainable approach to plant nutrition is also attractive to consumers who prioritize environmentally friendly and ethically produced products. We can target local farms through direct marketing and partnerships, offering PPF as an alternative to traditional fertilizers and synthetic plant foods. PPF has the potential to become a go-to product for local urban farms looking to improve their soil health and promote sustainable agriculture. Now, here's our timeline. What you need to know is that first goes feasibility, installation, commissioning, and then operations. As you can see, we are at uh, the feasibility study about to conclude which will enable us to go into the installation planning the logistics and then execute. We start up the digester and we hope to operate. We don't know the dates yet, but we'll get there. We are fortunate enough to have a diverse uh, funding team, either directly or indirectly. We have um, access to two uh, funds from the city of Seattle from different initiatives, one from King Conservation District and another indirect fund that goes to our host, Food Lifeline, um, for the purchase of the biodigester. So what are the next steps? Well, if this economy model is successful, it could be a rep rep replicable model for marginalized communities. By scaling up the biodigester project to a larger size, more food waste could be produced, which means a larger amount of probiotic plant food, 
uh, will be produced. This would have a positive impact on the environment by reducing the amount of food waste sent to landfills, while also creating an opportunity for marginalized communities to access fresh produce and promote sustainable agriculture. The project could be replicated in other communities that are facing similar challenges, providing a scalable and sustainable solution that benefits both people and the planet, taking a step in the right direction. So what's our ask? We are seeking your help in creating a strong network of clients for our probiotic plant food. We believe that this innovative product can make a real difference and we need your assistance to move forward. With your support, we can expand our reach and bring benefits to bring benefits of our probiotic plant food to a wider audience. By building a strong network of clients, we can increase the demand for our product and help urban farmers, farmers locally achieve a healthier, more robust crops. Thanks. Uh, that was great. It's good to see a, a focus on digestate with all the AD units going on up there. Is really interested to see what are we doing with that rich material you're putting in bottles and giving it to your community. So good for you. Just curious, uh, any plans to use the biogas uh, from the digester? Yeah. So at the moment with the feasibility study, we're looking to expand um, on the probiotic plant food but we have looked at the energy aspect of it as a byproduct. Um, one of that could be applicable in a charging station. Um, but since we are limited in space in our host site at Food Lifeline, we can't use the biogas yet. Um, but as I mentioned, it's a scalable project. So if we manage to move to a different site or expand within Food Lifeline, we are hoping to incorporate that so we can actually produce energy from it. I'm curious if you could talk a little bit more about the feedstock that's going into it um, in terms of just have you looked at how how you're going to source enough to feed the digester and um, yeah, and how confident you are that you're going to have like a sustainable um, source of food waste to to support the digester at the scale you're looking at. Yeah. So the choice of, of location of the biodigester was a strategic one because um, Food Lifeline, obviously, as a food bank, has a lot of food waste. So on a first um, stage, just to operate at capacity, we would be using their food waste um, to put in the biodigester. And then we are hoping to reduce that amount or that um, input from Food Lifeline and change it to um, community food waste coming from residents, coming from businesses, uh, especially restaurants. But that is um, a step that we need to take um, in terms of analyzing how to educate the community and separating properly uh, for the biodigester. What are the unit economics of production of the plant food? and? When you think about this serving a community, does the price point make sense for the different communities that you're trying to support? Right. So we're a community organization. We're not trying to make profit per se, but one angle that we can support the community through is to help them stop paying for composting. Um, that's one thing. Um, also, as a community organization, in educational workshops, we try to provide stipends as well. Um, and we would also be creating employment for the community, um, for, to, for the operation of the biodigester. Mentioned earlier, um, your partnership with, um, Impact, um, Bioenergy, I think it was. Can you talk a little bit more about that, how, how that partnership is structured and, um, any other partnerships that you might have in play that you did not mention today? Yeah, well, we have a bunch of stakeholders um, in this project. Um, the first is the community for us. Then um, we have others uh, such as our fiscal sponsors, et cetera, et cetera. But 
with Impact by Energy, we've been structuring a project, um, mostly thinking about purchase, purchasing a biodigester from them, um, modeling our feasibility study, mo modeling our stages. I've consulted with them many times um, to, to see how the project is going to look in the future. I don't know if that answers your question, but um, if you've done any um, like uh, consumer testing on the PPF, you said you know building the network um, of consumers is important to the to the model. Um, have you had an opportunity? To, I know Impact Bioenergy has some other units that produce this. Have you had a chance to, to try it out in the community and get feedback about the um, interest in the product? Yeah, so um, since the biodigester in South Park is not installed yet, we haven't been able to produce any um, probiotic plant food, but we are playing, paying a lot of close attention to um, the Vashon Bioenergy farm that has ties with other farmers where they actually use um, that plant food. We um, have worked closely, at least with one farmer, in at seeing the effects of the plant food and how um, healthy these pro pro that produce comes out and and um, the way they use it, their opinions about it, and um, we're working on getting more feedback on that as well. Thank you, Cesar. That was great. Up next, and actually last but not least, is uh, Ravel. So Ravel is a Seattle-based startup with an experienced technical team building market-based circular economy solutions to the textile waste problem. They develop technology to allow for the efficient endless recovery and recycling of fiber from textile waste as circular inputs for new textiles and are now working to demonstrate and commercialize their system. Dalen, will you come on up? Thanks, y'all. Hello, I'm Zaylin, uh, CEO of Ravel, and we are a circular economy solution for textile waste. I started a few years ago here in Seattle with this vision, a world in which the way that we consume clothing supports people and the planet to prosper in harmony. And yet here we are. Most of our clothing ends in landfill and a lot of that in the global South in places like this. 82% of clothing in the USA is thrown away in under one year. Let's jump back for a second. Here's me in the early 2000s doing better now, uh, running an apparel supply chain. Uh, my siblings and I were building a rapidly growing eco-friendly sports clothing brand. Um, we did our best to make everything high quality and durable with the latest and greatest blends of technical fibers. Um, so while I'm sure there's plenty of it still out there, uh, I'm probably responsible for half a million items of clothing currently in landfill around the world. Back to today. 150 billion items were made in 2022. Not by us, by the way. <laughs> uh, we're consuming obscene amounts of apparel and it's all ending up in the trash. Now, this is a, a global problem. Massive volumes, low quality materials are being turned out, almost no clarity on uh, what the impacts they have or where they're coming from. And the majority of clothing typically ends up downcycled or dumped overseas. Um, the fashion industry is caught up in the greenwashing campaigns and making uh, commitments to do better in the future. We see this as a huge commercial opportunity. So we're all wearing clothing, thank you. Most of it is complex blends of different types of fiber and other additives. So we know this is a hard problem to solve. There can be more ingredients in a shirt than a gas station frozen burrito. There's a reason, of course, blended fabrics are the best of all worlds. It's what everyone wants. It's comfort, it's durability. It's stretch, it's non-recyclable, blended material clothing. But that's exactly what our patent pending IP 
addresses. We have figured out how to separate the raw materials back out so that they are circularly reusable and isolate the gunk from concentrate for concentrated safe disposal. So in essence, we're completing this circle. On the one side, brands are grasping for sustainable end of life solutions for waste, and we can serve that market. But on the other side, with the lion's share of our revenue model, we sell high quality fiber to apparel brands to use in new clothing. Let me frame this up to show you how big it actually is. First brands are making huge promises. All these folks up here, check your labels. Net zero by 2030, all sustainable materials by 2025, et cetera. And the truth is the global infrastructure and the technology isn't in place to meet even a fraction of these promises. Yet most of what's being made and planned is still multi-material blended fibers. 85% of its polyester cotton blends increasingly with high percentages of elastane. And those are the exact materials that we can uniquely extract, purify, and reproduce. So here's where we stand, with a unique opportunity to control the future of textile raw materials. Ravel holds that key to unlocking truly sustainable fashion. And the potential is huge. Global textile fiber is a $175 billion industry. Um, less than 5 billion of that is sold as sustainable. So no matter what, we can start with that. Um, we're not the only ones in the space. There are about a dozen other companies tackling uh, uh, complex textile waste. Our key differentiation is that we take in all cotton poly blends, including the holy grail of high elastane content. Our model is a light touch process that maintains the quality of the raw materials and selectively cleans out the stuff we don't want. It's a low energy, low cost, low footprint solution. Our progress to date includes providing, uh, approving our technology at lab scale in our factory space here in Seattle um, and securing additional grant funding to de-risk some of the tech with R&D for a proprietary process. Uh, currently working on our pilot scale system, around 100 pounds a day. Our next milestone is our first commercial facility with a capacity to process 650,000 pounds of fiber per year, uh, which will generate our initial revenue based here in Seattle. And that's the waste we're working with. Um, key funders for our progress to date have been National Science Foundation's SBIR program. Um, and Ravel is thrilled to be part of a, a, an incredible circular economy program um, here in King County, where we're working closely with Goodwill to transform their textile waste into socks, to donate to the houseless population in the Seattle area, and additional materials uh, to work with Ming Ming and the Refugee Artists Initiative for their products. Um, so in addition to overwhelming market pull, we are uh, definitely in a regulatory tailwind. Um, European policy is already having impacts on the global supply chain for sure, um, and systems change is coming. So our unit level economics are strong. Um, in our first facility, we'll achieve a 60% gross margin um, on a pound for pound basis, which will improve as we scale. Um, we're initially targeting a $31 million uh, uh, revenue by 2027. Um, and then it's off to the races after that. Our sales pipeline is primed right now. Um, we're having brands waiting for us to get to commercial scale. Um, over the last year or so, I've spoken to over 300 textile industry leaders. Um, resulting in supply chain partnerships, LOIs with uh, up and coming brands, uh, early conversations with two big box retailers, who you all will probably know, um, and an initial pilot with a household name in sustainability apparel space. Everything in the market is signaling that the demand is there. We know the supply is there and uh, we have the tech. Now it's about executing. Excited about the economic uh, opportunity, but also the important impact our company can have on the climate crisis. Uh, we save 72% over virgin materials of emissions, which is a huge improvement for an often overlooked industry. And as we scale, so does the real tangible impact of the solution. Uh, diverse team is uniquely equipped to tackle this. Our experience spans uh, fiber engineering, polymer chemistry, textile manufacturing, um, global supply chain, and uh, sustainable business. We exist to create this technology and the infrastructure for circular textiles and enabling that endless flow of fiber free from waste. So join us in this material resolution. Uh, at worst, I've pulled a thread in your brain there. At best, you'll never forget it. Um, we're looking for partners. We are hiring and we're fundraising a seed round to build out that commercial scale facility. Um, reach out if you wanna talk more about that. Um, thank you for your time and happy to answer any questions.
Thanks, Aylin. I think I'll, I'll start the questions off here. Um, I'm curious about the, what's the right word for this? Like the, the, the footprint that you, the, the, the area that you think a single processing facility, like when you're at commercial scale, how, how far reaching do you think you can or need to be in order to get the amount of material needed to process? And is this something that you're seeing gets replicated on a community by community basis, or um, is it a broad regional processing center? Great question. Um, footprint is important to us, and it's actually important to the model because we don't want to be designing something that requires moving trash around. Um, so the the scale of, of waste that is currently already concentrated within the ecosystem at places like Goodwill or other um, sort of textile aggregation points is more than enough uh, to service this first this first facility, this commercial scale facility, and that times twenty um, just here in town. Um, but the the elegant version is is you know L.A. next, New York, uh, almost any mid tier city could uh, could work with on, with our with our sort of distributed model. Um, and then eventually overseas, because there's certainly a model there too for, for transforming other waste. So you said this is a proprietary technology or process, but yes, you sir. said it's low energy, it's low touch. So what have you figured out that nobody else has? Good question. Um, uh, we, when we first started looking at the problem, um, we realized that mixed textile waste is what we want to tackle. That's that the bottom of the pyramid that sort of no one else wants to deal with. Um, and there is um, a, a, a MIT PhD, also poet, who's my technical counterpart, um, uh, speaks of it in sort of a, a way of a spiritual way of maintaining the value and quality of a polymer um, instead of bashing it all up or degrading it or melting it down as you've heard some other from some other folks um so there's a there uh, our approach originally was about trying to maintain the quality of that material so that led our technical um pathway into trying to trying to make sure that this, the circumstances in which we're process, processing is fits those those characteristics of low heat for example low impact non-toxicity um it's kind of a, a three-quarter answer to your question wondering how much does this technology um, discourage reuse and are you targeting certain types of clothing for recycling um targeting certain type of clothing uh, uh condition um it's i don't i don't want to take anything off the racks that's like an easy way to think about it once stuff goes to goodwill i'm not going in there and like pulling stuff off the rack there. It goes through Goodwill, it goes through the Goodwill system, it goes through the bins, uh, raise your hand if that's that was your um, that, your, 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 your childhood. Um, you know, uh, but after it's gone through the bins, there's, that's like, it's it's seen all of its chances for reuse um, and sometimes for all, also for material use as a, as a piece of fabric. And that's when we want it, when it's destined for landfill. So we want that last dispersion point after it's been concentrated and looked through. Um, yeah, so I don't, I don't, I don't want to take anything away from anybody else, and that's kind of why we developed it the way we do to be able to deal with. So it doesn't matter if it's torn, it doesn't matter if it's stained. Our process can clean out those the dyes, the additives, the things that make it so it's non-recyclable essentially already in the existing infrastructure. It's kind of like um, when you make clothing, uh, and it, you might say polyester cotton on the back of your label, right? But there's a whole bunch of stuff in there, and um. If you're trying to recycle it, it's kind of tr kind of like trying to um, to blow a bubble with bubble gum after you've also eaten some chips. So it's just <laughs> it just doesn't work, right? Um, so we we're 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 like we figured out how to get the chips back out there, and now we can all blow bubble gums again, right? But um... oh. Oh, one quick one. So uh, understanding IP concerns, CBI, and everything sounds like you feel you you got a lot of hurdles overcome because a build out and taking all this material and chemically separating it seems like a hurdle. Do you see any things in terms of environmental footprints or locating or energy concerns? Like when you actually try to find a site and you build out, 
are there any hurdles that you still see that you feel you can overcome without obviously sharing your secret? Yeah. Um, I've had a couple talks with a couple uh, agencies, local, local and state, um, about like, where can we do this? And um, the, the, my dream model is to be able to co-locate at Goodwills. I mean, not to just say Goodwill, there's lots of other organizations that are doing really great work in that, in that space of um, sort of being able to recover value from, from waste. Um, so co-locating at Goodwills for part of a process or all of the process is the dream. And um, you know, energy is energy. That's a, a whole nother uh, conference, uh, a whole nother presentation in the other room over there about all the great things that are happening about renewables. If we can, if we can capture renewables as an assumption that's going forward, the energy costs is sort of like where we're trying to park our our, our footprint. Um, and it's a lot lower. It's way lower than depolymerization. It's way lower than, than virgin materials, obviously. Yeah, so thank you. All right, folks, the moment we've all been waiting for. Uh, I hope you all had a good time networking in the other room while the judges sat back here and deliberated these di difficult decisions for such great uh, presentations today. So. As you know, we've got 26,000 and change to distribute in awards. Um, and many of, much of that is provided by, all of that is provided by our sponsors. And so another thanks to our sponsors. Um, I do want to mention that in addition to the, uh, the, the money that this award represents, there is also a complimentary registration for Circularity 23 conference um, here in Seattle, June 5 through 7, which is a value almost $2,000. So that's actually pretty significant as well. So thanks to Circularity in Seattle um, Office of Economic Development for making that happen. Uh, so I am going to invite Tina up here to announce the Upstream Award. Thank you. I am truly inspired today, Just truly inspired. Um, I don't know if you all remember where you were in March 2020. Um, I was working in children's toxics and um, myself questioning if I should have children. Um, you know, just as an everyday citizen, it's easy to get caught up in the state of our environment and working day to day in environmental situations, it's easy to get bogged down, mired down in the state of our world. And today you all have truly lifted me up as someone who has a pandemic toddler and is a mother of two girls. The next time I fill my fiat to the brim, Lisa, I will think of you. <laughs> and Ming Ming, you moved me to such emotion today to think of the women that you lead and you are such an inspiration to us. And Zaylin, I every time I wear something that I have owned for 20 years, as it, it lives to the end of its life, I will think that when it comes to it, I will make sure it gets in your hands. So thank you all so much for bringing some hope back that I have done the right thing in bringing these little people to the world and that they will do good things. So it is my great pleasure to announce the winner of our Upstream Award today. I think it is no surprise to anyone that this award goes to Refugee Artisan Initiative. Artisan. 
Thank you, Tina and Ming Ming. The next award is the Downstream Award, um, which actually my firm RRS is sponsoring. And so um, I didn't prepare anything to say, and I think you all have heard stuff from me today. Um, but yes, this is a, a passion of mine and, and supporting uh, these teams that have come through the program and to see their growth has is, is really been inspirational for me. And I'm, I'm really proud to announce the award winner, which is going to Ravel. So I'd like to invite Vin up to the stage to or the podium, I should say, to deliver the Community Impact Award. Well, thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, I also didn't prepare anything to say. <laughs> but I, I will say I can absolutely echo the sentiment that um, I, too, at times have been a, a, a climate skeptic. And man, that is a dark hole to go down. I'm also realizing because I didn't prepare anything to speak, I, I may cuss. I apologize in advance for that. But it's really, really inspiring to see not only inventive solutions in business models, but in a communal level. I think we sometimes can get so caught up in turning our economic system into a sustainable one. We, we oftentimes may forget it is about the environment and people who live in it. Um, so uh, the Office of Economic Development of which I'm a member of, I and my office exists to essentially say, if you are a sustainable business organization in Seattle, we are here to ensure your success. I'm here to be a catalyst and remove barriers for you find funding and just be an, an ally in any way I can. So I'm happy to announce that the Community Impact Award winner today is Restaurant to Garden. Oh yeah. 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 This is going to make a really big difference. Thank you, everybody. And last but not least, we have the People's Choice Award. You all have spoken both here and, and online. And um, so I'm going to invite um, Kamal up to the stage. I know you have a couple of other folks. I'll let you introduce them because I don't have their names in front of me. Sorry. <laughs> and there's the award. Becca, thank you. You want to introduce yourself? Yeah, uh, or I think that's all it's all. Oh, there's a mic there. Okay. Hi, everybody. My name is Rebecca Bear, and I want to give a big shout out to our restaurant to Garden. Um, I'm the CEO of the Seattle Parks Foundation, and their work is a project of the Seattle Parks Foundation. So congratulations. Um, also, also the work of the um, Duwamish Valley Sustainability Association. Um, and so what, what does Seattle Parks Foundation do? We, uh, we cultivate and support and a community in creating thriving and equitable um, and sustainable public spaces. So i um, super excited um, to have this opportunity to support this event and uh, I'll hand it over to my, yeah. yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Dan Bernard. I'm with King County Communities of Opportunity and um, pleasure to be here. I prepared a little something because most of you probably don't know what COO is, but we're, uh, Similar to Next Cycle, we're a, a collaborative in with uh, three sectors. We have King County as public sector. We have Seattle Foundation representing private sector, ph philanthropic, and most importantly is community. And we partner with community uh, in developing more equitable solutions uh, around um, 
race and economic uh, prosperity. And just like we've heard today, I'm just, I love the hearing about these, all, all of the presentations were wonderful and amazing, but for communities of opportunity to hear these community-based solutions um, to uh, issues in their uh, communities, as well as that are really thinking uh, globally, but acting locally, that is uh, just a pleasure for us to support here. Um, my name is Kamal. I'm, uh, I work with Next Cycle. I also um, help run Circular PNW. Uh, we are a citizen-led participatory uh, bioregion um, convener. Uh, we are connecting circular pioneers to evolve communities of practice towards an equitable transition to a circular economy in our region. Um, our members and projects cover British Columbia, Washington, and Oregon with leadership in all major cities. And many of them are in this room. And I think it's been wonderful to see this community grow and do this work together. Uh, so we're gonna present this. You wanna say this at the same time? Or, uh, so the People's Choice Award, Award goes to one, two, three. Refugee Artisan And so as, as they say, that's a wrap, guys. Um, thanks for staying all day. This has been a great event. Um, how about another round of applause for all the presenters today? Let's give a round to the judges. Um, and I want a special shout out to the staff that made this happen. It's been great. Liz, Kristen, Bridget, Kamal, Lizzie, May, Lynn. Hope I'm not forgetting anyone, but y'all did an awesome job. I thought this event went great from front to back, programming, food, every which way. So thanks everyone for making it happen. Um, for those of you that were the award sponsors and winners, if you could just stick around a couple minutes, um, the lighting in here isn't great for the photo ops, so we're going to try to do another one out in the lobby where it's a lot nicer. So um, otherwise, um, I want to just point you to, you know, if you want to learn more about Next Cycle, um, about all the things we do, stay tuned for when the next cohort comes out, which we don't have a date yet, but there will be a, another cohort. Um, check us out by uh, scanning that QR code, find us on LinkedIn, contact us at nextcyclewa at recycle.com. Um, and, you know, come to our events when we have them and, and including online webinars um, and in-person events. Uh, we will be representing at WSRA and at Circularity 23. And so, yeah, just come find us, be part of the community, be part of the network. We can, you know, develop solutions together for an equitable circular economy in Washington and beyond. So thanks everyone.